Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Centre for Progressive Policies Inclusive Growth Conference. I'm Rithala Shah, and I'll be with you till half past four this afternoon. And it is going to be a fantastic afternoon. I, for one, am delighted to be out of my back bedroom. I still haven't lost the thrill of going places. Uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, there is so much to talk about and so much to find out this evening, this afternoon. There's some exciting news to share, apart from anything else. The conference has co coincided with uh, the CPP being awarded, uh, well, nominated and shortlisted for the Prospect Think Tank Awards in not one, but two categories, the economics category and the one to watch. Congratulations to everyone involved. It is fantastic for your work to be recognized. Speaking of good work, there are some fantastic speakers that we're going to hear from this afternoon. Uh, and those of you on Zoom, do do join in because not only are we going to hear from some fantastic speakers, we also want to hear your questions and your thoughts. You'll be able to use that Q&A function on Zoom and we'll try and get as many of those questions on as we can. And a reminder that we're also live streaming on the conference website via YouTube. We're also on Twitter using the hashtag IGConf2021 and on Facebook Live as well. So please spread the word for uh, all of those who want to join the conversation live. There's quite a few buzzwords in there as well, actually. I forgot to mention those. There's levelling up. What else is there? There's going to be the role of the public and private sector. Ooh, trans just transition. A bit of catchphrase bingo. I think you can probably play privately. Thinking about today's main theme, I spent last week in Denmark, and what really struck me is how much political and public consensus there is around the idea of a green and just transition. People really buy into this and uh, I think it probably makes it much easier for governments to push through dramatic changes. I was speaking to the Danish Climate and Energy Minister, Dan Jorgensen, and uh, he was confident that there are already in Denmark more jobs in the renewable sector than there ever were in oil and gas. Here in the UK, we're in a very particular moment as we emerge, obviously, from the pandemic. We're at a point where the government is about to announce some important spending plans. Yesterday, obviously, we had the announcement of the net zero strategy. So there are lots of decisions to be made in the weeks ahead. And of course, we're just days away from COP26 in Glasgow when actually the world comes together to make some important decisions. So with all that in mind, today is the perfect opportunity to discuss some of the choices and alternatives that lie ahead when it comes to climate change. We'll begin by hearing from some important policy makers. They'll tackle some of the big themes of the day. And then, of course, we will be discussing with our panels those ideas in more detail and throughout, we'll be keen to hear your questions. So please make sure you put those in. Without further ado, let me hand over to our host, whose imminent arrival has kindly let her be with us today. <laughs> it's given us a pause for thought. Charlotte Aldridge, Aldridge, sorry, I apologize. Charlotte Aldridge is the Center for Progressive Policies Director. Charlotte. Thank you, Ritala. As a bit of a Radio 4 addict, it's a real honour to be sharing a stage with you today. Welcome, everyone, to the return of CPP's annual inclusive growth conference, the biggest of its kind in the UK. This afternoon, as Rittler said, we have the opportunity to stand back and take stock of the nature and pace of change since we last met before the pandemic. With the spending review budget and COP26 just a few days away, much seems to hang on the policy decisions being taken now. But if we're to have a lasting positive impact, we'll need to look both further ahead and reflect on patterns and trends long before the pandemic struck. Inequalities between people and places have held back our communities and undermined UK productivity for decades. Government, governments have tried and largely failed to deliver. Lasting change will take the work of a generation across parties and over successive parliaments. Today, we launch a powerful cross-party statement of key principles and policies designed to create a healthier, greener and fairer economy. You'll hear from Labour and Conservative MPs looking to truly level up, build back better and act now for clean, inclusive growth. This is the topic of today's conference, and we'll be joined by a stellar list of leading thinkers and practitioners from across the UK and beyond. 
Much has changed over the last 20 months. Government has experienced firsthand, at scale, the long acknowledged link between the health of the population and the health of the economy. Latest official data shows that over the last decade, life expectancy has fallen in some parts of Leeds, Newcastle, Manchester, Liverpool and Blackpool to below 70 for men and below 75 for women. CPP's recent report with the Northern Research Group of Conservative MPs called on the government to focus its attention on investment in social infrastructure as a means to level up, particularly via education and preventative health. The new Chief Executive of NHS England, Amanda Pritchard, has pledged that health inequalities will be a priority. But how realistic is that when waiting lists are already at 5 million and rising? We'll hear from Anita Charlesworth from the Health Foundation shortly. Government danced a delicate line with business during the height of the pandemic and since. Unprecedented peacetime sums of taxpayer money have been used to support firms through loans, grants and a rapidly introduced furlough scheme. At one stage, over a quarter of the UK workforce was on furlough. And the CPP, we've been tracking the efficacy of government's intervention to shore up and level up the economy during the pandemic. Our latest levelling up outlook showed that low earners consistently bore the brunt of the crisis. But we have seen businesses rally to innovate new technologies, particularly in healthcare, shift production lines and adapt supply chains. And we've heard the leaders of some of the UK's largest firms commit to play their part in building back better. Does this represent a permanent change in the way firms do business? Internationally re renowned economist and author and Abisa Moyo will help us take stock of shifting attitudes in the boardroom and what this could and should mean for a greener, more inclusive economy. But just as the impact of the pandemic looked like it was starting to lift, we're seeing inflationary pressures mounting pushed up by the triple quick squeeze of COVID lockdown, Brexit fallout, and a bounce back in UK and global demand. Government has chosen this time to use, uh, sorry, chose, government has chosen to use this time to administer what it sees as overdue medicine, ensuring we rely less on cheap migrant labor, upskill our workers at home, and shift to a high productive, high wage economy. But will this kind of shock therapy work and at what cost to whom? Is it a step forward for globalization and inclusive growth, or a step too far, too soon, as the UK and global economy emerges from COVID shutdown? Ian Golding, Oxford University Professor of Globalization and Development, will share his thoughts on how we move from global crisis to a better world. Much hope of a better world is being rested on COP26, hosted by the UK. Painfully, though, the timing of the summit falls in the middle of an evolving energy crisis and existential squabbles within government continue to play out as to whether and how to support high carbon intensive energy uh, industries to weather the storm. Does this give a hint of things to come as to how we're thinking about how or how not to transition our economy? And most importantly for us at CPP, how do we avoid the same communities who bore the burden of sectoral change and dislocation in the 1980s? The same communities who bore the burden of the Global Depression in 2008 and who've borne the burden of COVID-19 fall falling further behind in the shift to net zero emissions. We'll look at these issues and more in our sessions on levelling up cities and a just transition. Here we build on our work we've been doing as hosts of the IGN, a network of places across the UK pioneering ways to transform their economies. The Inclusive Growth Network celebrated its first anniversary last month and look out for our political communique from local and regional leaders during COP26 on what they're doing to act now for clean, inclusive growth. So it's wonderful to be back with you, reflecting on the change and constants of the last few years and focusing, as ever, on the issues that matter for people and places. There seems to be a rare moment for change and an ever rarer consensus on what we're aiming for. Call it levelling up, call it inclusive growth or a fairer, greener economy. The challenge is how we achieve that goal and what we need to do now and over the next decade to make it happen. Charlotte, thank you so much for those uh, thoughts. It really helps to set the sort of introductory foundation, in a sense, for the day that lies ahead.
Our next speaker is going to encourage us to be a little bit more positive. Ian Golden is Professor of Globalisation and Development at the University of Oxford and the Director of the Oxford Martin Research Programmes on Technological and Economic Change, Future of Work and Future of Development. His talk today is entitled Getting Lost from a Global Crisis to a Better World. Professor Golden, over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. And, uh, it's a huge pleasure and privilege to be able to participate in the CPP conference on inclusive growth, a very timely conference which comes at a critical time as we think about how we take the lessons from the pandemic, how we act on COP26 and how we ensure that this terrible crisis that we've all endured does indeed lead to a better world. My worry is the language of bouncing back or bouncing forward because that implies we stay on the same tracks that we are, when really we need to change our ways. That's the road that will lead over a precipice. That is what has brought us the pandemic, it's brought us climate change, rising inequalities, and will lead to a totally unsustainable future. Even the language of reset troubles me, because that implies we go back to the operating system which we already have. We need to do something different. We need to see this as the wake up call. In my recent book, Rescue, I compare the first and second world war crises and try and learn the lessons. And of course, the terrible tragedy of the first world war is that it did not lead to a better world. It lead to a continuing cycle, a roaring twenties of a century ago of consumption fueled inflation. And then of course, a great depression, rising inequality, spurring growing protectionism and nationalism and an even worse war. But the Second World War was a very different crisis because in the midst of it, the visionary leaders, but more than that, the population saw the need for change, for fundamental change. And we had the creation of the welfare state. We had the creation of the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, the Marshall Plan, and a totally different world came out that has led to real progress over the period that followed. And so let's hope that we are in that sort of phase. But it wasn't just the brilliance of Roosevelt and Churchill and their ability to juggle multiple balls and see the future in this repetitive cycle of crises that had happened. It was the population. A rather bland, almost unknown figure, Clem Attlee, swept Churchill away before, despite Churchill being the war hero six weeks after the end of the Second World War because people demanded change. And so my hope is we in that moment, we in that moment where we recognize that business as usual, going back to what we had before, is not what we need. And although the prospect of change may seem scary to many, my view is that it's far less worrying than a continuation of business as usual. That's what will lead to more inequality, more instability, more crises to come, and we will certainly have more of them unless we act differently. This pandemic has led to very rapid rises in inequality within countries and between them. Within countries, while some, not those, at least those that have property or have investments in technology and other uh, shares, as well as those that have worked remotely have done very well. Law firms are booming as their costs have gone down and their business has gone up and so too are banks and others. Over half the population has done extremely badly. And we see this in the very unequal dispersion of the mortality rates in COVID, but more than that, the economic implications. And globally, this pattern has been repeated. The World Bank estimates that the pandemic will lead to over 150 million people pushed into absolute poverty. World Food Programme estimating a similar sort of number of people suffering from extreme malnourishment. These are the second order effects of the pandemic as countries are closed off, as migrant workers no longer send back their remittances as people suffer terribly. And so the SDGs have been totally derailed. And although the rich countries have found $17 trillion in stimulus packages to support their workers through furlough schemes and to support their businesses from going bankrupt, Less than half of 1% has gone in international aid. In fact, in the UK, tragically, at a time when it's never been more needed, we've cut our aid by a third. People in the UK, 
and people around the world need government now. And the good news is what seemed impossible in January 2020 in terms of government actions now is commonplace. Indeed, conservative governments in the UK and elsewhere are doing things that Labour governments would have not been able to do in January 2020. So the pendulum has swung and the question is, will it swing back again or are we on some sort of permanent cusp of change? And that's the decision we face as voters, as activists, as businesses. COP26 coming up in a couple of weeks reminds us too that these crises feed off each other. We would not, I believe, have Brexit in Britain. We would not have had Trump in the White House had it not been for the rising inequalities and anger with the urban elites that had caused the financial crisis and the consequences of that crisis. And similarly, the pandemic is leading to growing anger, to growing inequalities. And we see the rise of anti-vaccination movements and nationalism and protectionism in a number of countries. Climate change similarly has very uneven implications. It's essential that the COP26 does lead to fundamental changes, not incremental and too little is happening too slowly. So we need much more urgency domestically in the UK and globally. We need to honor the Paris Agreement and we need to go beyond. The danger with stimulus packages, as we've learned from the 2008 financial crisis, is that they can lead to rapid increases in carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases. What we saw then was a lull in these emissions during the crisis, and that's what we've seen during the pandemic. But then afterwards, as money was poured into concrete, in steel, into infrastructure, into stimulus packages, a very rapid increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Is the 17 trillion that's been found now, much of it going into infrastructure and other stimulus packages going to lead to the same outcome? Or can we do things better? Can we really have a Green New Deal? Can we ensure a just transition? Not only in the UK, where we protect the workers who are going to be worse affected, but globally. The miners, those that work, depend on the system. And we need to ensure that we do that. And there are many countries, not least South Korea, which are showing the way to do this. There are ways of doing it. But we need to remember when we look at the aggregate numbers, more jobs will be created than destroyed by technological change or by climate change. That is different individuals often with different skills, different backgrounds in different places that are the winners and losers. And so ensuring that we provide the safety nets, ensuring that we do understand and empathize with those that will be anxious about change, might well suffer from it, and that we provide the means, the guaranteed minimum standards for society in health, in education, and in other areas. It's that which matters. It's no good saying to people that we'll have many new jobs, and we will, that the future will be bright, and it could be, unless it is for them too. And so ensuring that we take all parts of the country with us here, but also think about the rest of the world. This crisis provides a remarkable time to step back and think what to do differently. We could stop pandemics in the future, and we could stop financial crises, we could stop other crises what I call the butterfly defect of globalization, the underbelly of globalization. Our happy connectivity, not only spreading good things, and it has in the most remarkable ways, Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, new vaccines amongst the recent developments, but also spreading very bad things, anti-vaccination movements, jihadism, and of course, leading to spillovers like climate change. We need to coordinate between countries to manage this. There's no global problem that will not require the US and China and Europe to work together. And so the looming Cold War, the frictions between the US and China are deeply troubling. We cannot have global growth. We cannot have a resolution of the climate crisis. We cannot stop future pandemics unless these major powers work together. So finding a way as Kissinger and Nixon did so long ago, of working together while disagreeing on some fundamental issues is going to be absolutely vital. And at home, we need to ensure we do the same. The UK is declining as a global power. It's declining as a global economy. And yet, it has a vital role to play. It requires leadership 
It requires actions which show that positive change is possible. My hope is that this conference can build on the incredible things that are happening in our communities, in policy, and elsewhere, around the world, and at home. That we can think about how this crisis can lead to a new start, how we can rescue our societies, which I believe have been lost in many respects, have been meandering along a road which is an extremely dangerous one. But by working together and learning the lessons, we can, as has been demonstrated forcefully at various times in history, not least in the aftermath of the Second World War, we can come together to create a totally different and better world. And my hope is we seize this opportunity. If we don't do it now, I believe the opportunity will be lost for generation to come. And if it's not us that's going to be part of this process, then we are relinquishing responsibility. So my hope is that this is a wake-up call, this pandemic. It could have been worse, but unless we act, there will be others and other crises that will overwhelm our societies. And so it's incumbent on all of us to think about how we do things differently, to act differently. And my hope is to be part of a process, which I believe this conference contributes to, of creating a better world. Thank you very much. Professor Golden, thank you very much indeed. I think I rather mischaracterised you, actually. I said you were going to give us lots, lots of uh, room for optimism. You laid out the problems, I think, very, very well there. I wonder, though, you reflect back on the end of the Second World War. I wonder whether you see any similar political trends now. The United States, even under President Biden, is looking inwards. Uh, Europe is quite disunited. The United Kingdom has chosen to go its own way. Where do you think that kind of political unity that you're describing is going to come from? I think you're right, it's in balance. Um, I do take heart from many of the uh, things that are extraordinary acts of solidarity that happened in the pandemic and the fact that governments are doing things now which would have been regarded as absolutely beyond the pale, impossible uh, in January 2020. These are sources of optimism that governments can change uh, and that we can get totally. They're certainly happening in the US. It even happened in some respects under Trump where Trump was doing things like sending people checks uh, which would have been unimaginable before the pandemic. So. What we see is that governments can change and they can act forcefully and they can find the money if they have to uh, and that the old sort of ideas of debt ceilings and taboos uh, are what they are, taboos. I think in, in what we're seeing now too is a rise in activism, uh, whatever one makes of the changing political allegiances of the UK population. Uh, it's very clear to me that um, you know there's a lot of thinking going about about what sort of changes we want. So I think that's a source of change. The fact that Biden had a victory uh, in itself, of course, uh, I don't think would have happened if it hadn't been for the pandemic. So that that shows that people do think. But now the jury's really out. We have the midterms coming in the US. Um, we're gonna have a continuing political process in the UK. And I think it's incumbent on government to, to demonstrate it can actually do things. Can it reduce the NHS waiting lists? Can it close out uh, COVID? Can it do the leveling up it's been talking about for so so long? Or does it do that? And if it doesn't, I think the electorate will hold them responsible for the opposition. Can they come up with the ideas? I mean, one of the challenges of the present time is that the Conservatives have stolen the Labour's clothes in some areas. Uh, and so can Labour have a really different agenda which people can identify with? I think these are all in play. It's an extremely active time. It's all pointing to me to a listening to the population and to actions in ways that weren't there before. Even the leveling up agenda is a recognition that there was a domination from London uh, and the southeast of the UK. So I think there are signs of hope. As people would have told you in the, you know, in the middle of the Second World War and even the closing stages, and I think we're there, because they had no idea that that would lead to the creation of the welfare state, fundamental and changes in the global architecture and permanent peace. It was all in play. And then it was resolved favorably. So that's what's in play now. And I would say it's too early to say what the outcome is, but it depends in our, on our actions. So currently, of course, is one of 
uh, political polarization to some extent. There are big divides between the political parties. What's interesting, what we saw yesterday with the net zero strategy is actually climate change is something in which there is beginning to be a consensus in the UK. What role do you think it can play beyond obviously tackling the problem of climate change? Do you think it is a way through which, a prism through which other problems could be tackled in a less divisive, more inclusive way? Absolutely. I think climate change and the pandemic did this in a different way, is testing us. Can we work together to address a long-term problem that we all face nationally and globally? Um, that's going to involve some losses. <laughs> some of the companies will do worse off, the fossil fuel companies, stranded assets, etc. Some people will pay more for energy. There'll be higher taxes in some areas. So they real costs. And there's a strong role for government, but there's also a regulatory role. And of course, the private sector is key because the private sector is going to be making the investments and so on. So it's, it's a fantastically significant test. And I believe if we can c come through this and actually do things, we can't really become, rather than talk about being a global leader, <laughs> that, that needs to be shown um, in this respect. We would have learned to work together on critical global problems. And I think we would have also uh, got the incentive and regulatory structure right. It'll involve higher taxes for some, it'll involve very strong regulatory in interventions, and it's going to involve, I think, real solidarity with those that are going to be worse off as well as those who will benefit. If we can do that, I think we would have been learning to cooperate. It doesn't solve our problems, but it's a very important demonstration uh, of the ability to move forward. Big picture thought from you. Uh, the pandemic, in a sense, has led to some deglobalization, the need perhaps to shorten supply chains, that realization that uh, it, perhaps there's certain critical stuff, PPE, that you want to manufacture as close to home as possible. Uh, but tr looking at climate change involves a global effort. How do you think those two colliding, uh, colliding impetuses are going to work? Yeah. In, in rescue, I, I go into a lot of detail on this, and actually, I've come to the conclusion that talks of, uh, of deglobalization uh, are not accurate. In most respects, there's been an acceleration of globalization. We see it uh, in the prices of containers at the moment. Um, we see it in many respects, not so much in the UK because there's the Brexit effect as well. But when you look at the trade numbers, for example, uh, look at financial flows, look at digital flows, obviously, massive increases in those and goods and services have increased. So there are some dimensions. I mean, travel obviously was negatively affected, um, but the supply chains have held up actually remarkably well uh, during the pandemic. When we go to our supermarkets, we find the full range of food. Some items at some times, like masks and PPE equipment, but I don't blame supply chains on that as much as the just-in-time management of our hospitals and utilities. You know, they used to have stockpiles of this stuff. They no longer have them. And that's because capital tied up in spare parts is regarded as a liability, not an asset, as a bad thing, not a good thing on the balance sheet of private firms like banks uh, and others, but also of hospitals. Um, and that needs to change. I think, you know, it's not about supply changes. Do we actually keep more than a day's supply or a week's supply? Are we prepared for emergencies? Do we have spare beds? And when you look at the numbers on the NHS uh, on this, you see that we're, we're really not in, even in the top league in Europe or, or the world on this. You know, our capacity has been denuded by austerity and by other factors. And so I think we shouldn't give globalization a bad rap because we don't have PPE in our hospitals. Uh, we should actually uh, be focusing on our capacity to invest in these things. There's some things we might need to do more of regionally or locally, but that's very dangerous because actually we get cheaper, better supplies of things in many areas from around the world. And we shouldn't try and produce everything in the UK. We'll soon find our costs escalating and actually supplies could become more unstable because we'll end up with monopoly domestic suppliers who might not produce for various reasons. So having this globally diverse supply chain is an insurance against risk in many respects. Uh, and I think this hasn't been quite you know, factually interpreted in some of the media and elsewhere. But I, I believe that globalization has proved itself remarkably robust. But clearly what globalization spreads, it's not only good things like PPE equipment, vaccines, and the Me Too movement, it spreads very bad things too. And managing that is really where our priority should be.
Professor Golden, thank you for now. Stay with us. Uh, we're going to keep talking thank a little you. bit about the pandemic and our recovery from it. Let's hear now from Anita Charlesworth. She's Director of Research at the Real Centre Health Foundation, and Real stands for Research and Economic Analysis for the Long Term. She's a health economist with a background in government and policy, and she's also an honorary professor in the College of Social Sciences at the Health Services Management Centre at the University of Birmingham. And today, Anita's going to talk about adequate crossroads, the path towards a healthy recovery. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about health and the role of health in an inclusive economy. And we need to think about health in two ways in regards uh, to this. The first is the intrinsic value of health. One of the things that is so important to societies that we all as individuals hope to do is to ensure that ourselves and that those we love and care for are able to live a long and healthy life. It is the mark of success of a society, the extent to which each generation's health improves. The second thing, though, that's important about health is its instrumental value. So being healthy is important of its own right, but it's also really important for our ability to contribute to society more widely, our ability to uh, engage in voluntary activity, in being an active citizen in our society, our ability to work and, <clears throat> and, and to engage. So health matters. Before the pandemic, we saw that actually we were in something of a crisis around health. For decades, in fact, for over a century, it was true that every generation was on average healthier than the last. But since 2011, as Professor Michael Marmot has demonstrated so clearly, life expectancy increases have stalled in this country. Um, so, uh, but very importantly as well, at that same time that our overall life expectancy improvements have stalled, we've seen widening health inequalities. So um, men in the most prosperous areas of the UK live on average nine and a half years longer than men in the most deprived areas. For women, the gap is almost eight years. But over the last decade, that gap has increased. So our improvements in health overall had stalled, but the burden of that was being felt most in the most disadvantaged. It's also the case, though, that COVID, far from being something that really we were all in together, has been borne most heavily by those with the least ability um, <clears throat> to bear the brunt. And COVID has exacerbated inequalities in so many dimensions, but very importantly in health. So what we see is if we look at the under 65s, so people who should be expecting to live uh, many more years um, and, and contributing, that uh, the mortality rate in the under 65s from COVID was four times higher in the most deprived areas compared to the least deprived. So we had already uh, an enormous health challenge in our society and COVID has made that worse not better. I mentioned in the start of my talk the importance of the instrumental value of health as well, though. And here what we see is that overall, if we take work, one really important um, uh, measure of economic prosperity uh, and, and it, uh, important to individuals uh, as well, um, around 8 in 10 of working age people in the UK are in work. But if we look at people who have a work-limiting health condition, more than half of them are without employment. So health is a really important factor associated with inability to participate in the labour market. And of course, that's important because society loses the contribution of those people. It narrows their world, but also work is a route um, to economic prosperity. So it contributes to a vicious cycle then of ill health, lack of employment, lack of income, further ill health and <clears throat> isolation from society. Coming out of COVID then, it's really important that we conceptualise recovery in really broad terms and do exactly what was said before. And don't think about going back to where we were in January 2020, but build something in our healthcare system, 
in our health policy overall, which is much better and which has tackling inequalities at the heart of every dimension of policy. And I want to highlight three areas which I think are really important. One of the things that we saw in COVID was that the last decade prioritised efficiency above resilience. And this was never more so than in our NHS. And so as we think about post-pandemic healthcare systems and post-pandemic health policy, we need to put resilience on a par with efficiency. Resilience means a number of things. Most obviously, it means put, ensuring that we have capacity in our system, which means hospital beds, most importantly, staff, doctors, nurses, other healthcare professionals, uh, social care sector, which aren't running on permanently hot, which actually have enough people and enough facilities to deal with fluctuations in demand and need, and that that capacity is in the right areas of the country. What we've seen um, over uh, recent years is that um, capacity is too often not in the right place. So um, GPs in deprived areas, the front line, the front line of the front line of the NHS, treat, look after more patients um, once you adjust for need than other parts of the country. Um, <clears throat> that impacts obviously on the ability of those populations get access to primary care services, but also general practice is the gatekeeper then to specialised services. So really critical. But also resilience is about the health of our population. And over the last decade, one area of health spending which has been cut the most is um, spending on public health through local authorities, what is known as the public health grant. So in the last five years before the uh, pandemic, spending in real terms per person fell by over a third. And spending fell most in the parts of the country that need it uh, the most. So Blackpool, the most deprived upper tier local authority, had one of the largest cuts. And what has happened in the pandemic? We see obesity rates increasing. We see alcohol-specific problems increasing. Um, we see smoking that was falling beginning to rise in, in key groups. So a worsening of some of these really important determinants of health, in many cases in the communities that are already suffering from ill health. Spending on public health is some of the most cost-effective spending that there is. The return to every pound spent on the services within the public health grant is four times the return on spending in the, on the treatment end of our NHS. So we've systematically made our NHS less efficient and we've made our system less resilient in choosing not to prioritise public health. The second thing is dealing with the backlog. It is really hard, actually, to come to terms with the scale of the backlog. We have already 5.7 million people now waiting for NHS treatment. 300,000 of those have waited for more than a year. Those numbers are enormous, but they are, in fact, just the tip of the iceberg. So, because through the pandemic, many people couldn't get onto a waiting list, didn't have a need identified. And as Sajid Javid, the health secretary, has said, you know, that it is, there is a potential for the waiting list to grow to anything up to 13 million people. The numbers are really important, but actually what we've seen, because COVID affected our healthcare system and our population so unfairly, is, is that the waiting lists are greatest in the areas of disadvantage. The disruption to service was greatest there, and the recovery has been slowest. And things like independent sector capacity, which the NHS will need to use if it is to recover, tends to be in the more affluent parts of the country. So it's really important as we begin to tackle the waiting list backlog that we focus beyond the headline numbers, important though those are, and think very carefully about how we reach those who really uh, desperately need the care. The third area that we need to think about is how do we ensure that 
this um, health shock from the pandemic doesn't lead a scarring effect on some of those who <coughs> uh, um, have been affected most. And here in particular, I think there are two groups that we really need to think about. One is young people, and the other is people with, who've developed mental health problems and long COVID. These are people who've had a real uh, um, uh, shock through this period. Um, we know from areas like um, unemployment that you, depending on what you do when you have those shock, that can either be a horrible experience that you remember but you recover from, or it can be something that changes your trajectory through life. And the extent to which health services are available in a timely and appropriate fashion to support people with mental health problems, to support people with long COVID, and to support young people, particularly early years. And again, this is why these cuts to the public health grant are so important, because the public health grant is, covers services for under fives. <clears throat> and this is where, uh, sort of where head and heart need to point, point in the same direction. Okay. If we don't support people, young children, um, those with mental health problems, those with long, uh, long COVID now, not only does that change the outcomes for them, but those changed outcomes, those changed trajectories through life have wider social costs, and we all suffer from that. The final thing that we need to think about is that health, <clears throat> the health service and our health institutions um, can play an important part of recovery, both in improving health, but also in the wider economic and social regeneration. And we think a lot increasingly in healthcare now, the role of health as an anchor institution, the importance in designing re uh, recovery programs that make sure that who the health service is employing and how it's employing people um, really supports the health agenda. These are enormous institutions, the biggest employers in most communities, but also that as we build capacity and as we redesign healthcare systems to deal with these challenges, that we design in net zero. So we have a health service which is meeting the needs of our population, contributing to improved health outcomes, contributing also, though, to um, economic opportunity, to vibrant, flourishing communities and net zero. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anita. It was great to hear some of those uh, potential paths for the NHS and for health policy strategy. Uh, let's move then from the public sector to the private sector. Dambisa Moyo is an author and economist who influences key decision makers in strategic investments and public policy. She serves on a number of global corporate boards, including 3M uh, Corporation, Chevron and Condé Nast, as well as the Oxford University Endowment Investment Committee. Her areas of interest are in capital allocation, risk and ESG matters. Dambisa is going to be speaking to us about bringing businesses on board. Dambisa. I can't tell if you can see or hear me, but hopefully you can. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to participate uh, this morning on very, very important and timely uh, issues and conversation. Um, I, I, I feel, as I've been listening to my fellow panelists, that um, I actually can perhaps add a little bit more color and perspective in two particular areas that I don't feel have been quite um, captured in this conversation. Um, one is in the area of economic growth and, you know, at the risk of, uh, of um, making sure that we don't lose sight of that, the importance of growth. Um, I think that that's an important area uh, to uh, emphasize and I'll do that. And then secondarily, I've also not heard much about what the role of the public, the, excuse me, the private sector is in not just um, job creation and uh, providing a tax base, but really as being tip of the spear in some of the global public goods issues that have already been mentioned um, by my esteemed colleagues, things like climate action as well as inequality. Um, I should say I've been very struck by something that um, Professor Ian Golden said, and, uh, and I want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, from the very beginning that 
in the boardrooms in which I serve, whether it's corporate boardrooms, um, as, as mentioned, or in the Oxford University Endowment, or indeed um, working at, you know, in, the, in the government as a, a non-executive board member of the Department of International Trade, um, I think there are a few things that people ought to uh, perhaps uh, um, sort of reflect on. Um, first of all, um, in, in none of these boardrooms have I heard um, people uh, committed to status quo. So everybody recognizes that there's a need to update our models and our thinking, um, but I think there's also an important um, emphasis to inject realism into the speed um, in which we can address many of these massive problems affecting not just the UK, but the global economy and uh, geopolitics in general, but also the you know being a bit more realistic about uh, how we think not just about speed, but also the scale of impact um, uh, and sort of second order effects, which again, I will, I will come to in, in greater detail uh, in a moment. But nevertheless, um, I think it's important that we bear that in mind because I do think part of the schism that we see in political areas, but also in public policy specifically, really is born out of uh, a sense that perhaps there are people who are Luddites and sort of doggedly digging their heels into the status quo and not having a full appreciation for, um, for the, all the changes that we've learned from the financial crisis to more recently with COVID. And I, I want to just start off by saying that that is, is not the case. And in that sense, I agree with Professor Golden that we're not going back. Um, we're trying to move forward. So let me tackle these two areas, growth and the role of the private sector uh, in order. So let's start with growth. Um, and I think it's really important to remind people of why growth is so important. Um, and, and I say that because I feel like we've spent a decade, at least a, perhaps better part of a decade, certainly actually since 2000 and the battle in Seattle, um, really, I think, um, with, with a massive pushback against the notion of economic growth, against the notion of capitalism, um, certainly as it was uh, defined uh, before the business round table uh, um, statement in 2019, but also um, we spent a lot of time pushing back against corporations, um, and and there's been you know significant um, I would say upgrading and updating to the mandate of corporations, which I will come to in a moment. Um, but the, you know the, the backdrop of my comments um, are really uh, quite a hostile uh, I would say uh, um, environment globally around what the role of growth is. And so I, that, this is why I think it's an important starting point for our conversation. Um, so first of all, um, three reasons I believe growth is important as a reminder. Um, first of all, um, we need economic growth in order to improve living standards, as simple as that. Um, and the numbers I, I think are, are, are quite instructive. In order to double per capita incomes in one generation, which is a meaningful dent in poverty, um, in, a, in 25 years, which is about a generation, um, we need to be growing by 3% per year. Many economies, developed and developing, are no, no, growing nowhere near that number. Um, the UK before COVID hit, so 2019, was growing around 1.2 to 1.4%. Um, Germany, um, Q4 of 2019, again, before COVID hit, grew at 0%, 0% GDP. Um, the large emerging market economies where there are at least 50 million people, we're talking Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Russia, et cetera, are growing below that magic 3% number have been and really struggled to grow above it um, post the financial crisis. Um, of course, we are seeing an, an uptick in numbers uh, in 2020, but uh, excuse me, post 2020, 2021, we've seen an, a sort of a, a bounce back after that aggregate demand shock. But if you look at the IMF and World Bank, Bank forecasts for what happens in 2022 as well as 2023 and onwards, there are still ma material concerns about economic drag um, and what that might mean for um, solving a lot of living standard concerns, which Ian Golden pointed out. Um, and in fact, if anything, because of the pandemic, we are starting off in a worse, a worse position. Um, you know, I could go on on this specific point. Um, perhaps it, it's worth mentioning that um, we have a whole slew of headwinds, which will, I'm sure, will be a part of this discussion. But things like 
climate change, um, demographic shifts, the fact that today we're about 8 billion people and we will continue to grow um, at pace globally in terms of our population until it, 20, uh, until 2100, according to the UN, when it will be 11 billion people. I mean, these are massive changes in the demographic shifts around population that will have a real impact um, in terms of demand and supply across natural resources and many other uh, um, sort of uh, things like education and healthcare across society. Um, so we are in the middle of, of, of not just uh, crosshairs and crosswinds of, of climate change, of demographic shifts, um, of inequality concerns, but also technological changes. Um, and all of this is happening when governments are enormously strapped for cash. Um, and we can discuss the 17 trillion and some of the, the, the fact that governments have been um, quite much, very much on a spending spree, certainly to combat COVID and what that might look like. But it suffices to say, um, you know, even again, before COVID hit, there was a real concern that governments were not going to be able to deliver. Um, in fact, the, the Congressional Budget Office in the United States in 2016 was already cautioning that by 2030, the U.S. government would not be able to fund uh, Social Security, uh, Medicare and Medicaid. So what, what COVID has done is to accelerate or to catalyze some of this concern. So, again, number one, growth is important um, because of living standards. And we are in a precarious situation, uh, which has been exacerbated by um, COVID. The second reason growth is important is that, there, that, that there's a, a wide literature um, that shows that we, in order to hold government to account and to have competitive elections that are sustainable, democratic elections that are sustainable, you need to have achieved a certain per capita income, uh, level per capita income. Uh, in my books, I've, I've cited this uh, research in my book from 2018 called Edge of Chaos. Um, there's wonderful research by a, 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 a Professor Przeworski, um, where he basically says, if your per capita income is below $10,000, per year, then you're likely to have a lot of political volatility um, that is basically unsustainable for um, long-term policymaking, uh, a lot of disruptions, and only above $10,000. And in fact, those numbers have been adjusted to reflect inflation um, and a little bit higher now, but essentially um, only above those levels can democratic um, policy making systems um, thrive and, and really uh, survive over long periods of time. So as we think about the global economy and how many people's incomes have actually collapsed um, in developed economies, this is a real issue. Um, we know that in the United States, as an example, um, you know, the, the participation rates in elections for people who are $30,000 or less um, is, is, is very low. It's around 30 percent. It's very far from the one man, one vote, as we used to say, um, that uh, we, we hope for in a democratic system. So um, politically, having no growth is a problem. Um, and it, it's perhaps no surprises if you look around the world. The Stockholm Peace Institute does wonderful data talking about uh, political instability, the number of coups, the political uh, unrest that we see, and in, in some of it often on occasion on television, um, is really an artifact of, of, of the fact that you don't have a middle class that's able to hold the government to account, and this has real consequences for geopolitical risk. So that's the second uh, concern. Third issue um, with a, an absence of growth is a lack of innovation. Um, and again, it, no surprises here that even in the pressures and time constraints of trying to deliver a COVID vaccine, um, really it was developed economies that came up with the goods. Um, obviously, led by uh, organizations even here in the UK, but also um, in uh, in places such as uh, the United States and Germany. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Zambia. The notion that you were going to get a vaccine out of Zambia is pretty slim, uh, given the priorities and con real concerns, structural problems um, that have pervaded not just that country, but many emerging market economies over several decades. So no growth means essentially you don't satiate Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People are not getting educated. They can't feed themselves. They've got no shelter. The opportunity for them to research and develop um, technologies that could address pandemics or inequalities or, or concerns around um, climate action are slim to none. And again, without that economic growth that will improve people's living standards, um, we have that problem.
So I, I really emphasize these three points because I do worry a lot um, that the whole narrative about how do we create growth, how do we make sure that we don't lose sight of strategic and structural changes um, that could be, you know, uh, headwinds as well as, uh, you know, changes that uh, could help us or hinder us to achieve growth have been lost in a narrative um, that's very much driven in the here and now, much more tactics, less strategy. Um, and I think a lot of that is born from short termism, not just in the corporate boardrooms, but also in public policy, where policymakers are very rationally trying to win elections every two years in the US and, of course, uh, every five years in places like the UK. So um, growth needs to be back on the agenda, updated, of course, to reflect the need for regulation, updated to, you know, to uh, reflect the new priorities that w w I'll talk about in a moment, um, but it certainly needs to be part of our discourse. And I will just say, in order to achieve that, we do need to have everybody at the table. Um, this us versus them that has, has really, um, really cut through not just public policy, but also is creating fissures between, um, you know, the NGO sector, or civil society versus government versus business to such an extent that you can't even have one conversation around something like climate change in one place, um, I think is, is very corrosive and it will be incredibly damaging for us uh, longer term. I'm conscious of time. Let me very quickly go through the second aspects that I think were not really captured in the earlier conversations and perhaps maybe where I can add a bit more color. And this is really the role of corporations. Um, I wrote my most recent book, which came out in, in May, called uh, How Boards Work, really for two reasons. One was to reassert the important role that corporations play. And number two was because I realized that with all the fervent efforts uh, for people to either uh, condemn capitalism and try to break up corporations, um, there wasn't a real appreciation, um, it felt to me, for the, uh, the actual levers um, board members and corporations have to effect change. Um, we are not, uh, as someone who serves on corporate boards, we are not elected um, by the, the broader population um, to effect many social changes, and yet we're being asked to do that, whether it's around issues of abortion or obesity or climate change or racial discrimination. All of these things are critically important for whether or not corporations survive um, but traditionally, the expectation is that government should lead on a lot of these policy issues and corporations should play a, a sort of a second, um, albeit important role in trying to shape the future. That has not been the case. Um, and if anything, my, my concern is that there's a real risk that uh, corporations have lagged behind. Um, but just to really emphasize um, quickly where I think corporations um, have been um, value add over multiple centuries. I've actually served on many boards. One of the companies I've served on, Barclays Bank, has been around for over 330 years. That's a company that has obviously gone through World War One, World War Two, oil price shocks, economic calamities, oh, industrial. Because we do want to come to some questions, but go on, finish that. I see. Please. Okay, I'll finish the thought. But the point just being that with corporations, they are creating jobs. We need jobs. Government does not create jobs. It, it helps to create a policy environment for that. They are providing a tax base and they are supporting innovation. As we saw, when they work with government, they do a phenomenal job. So I think I was uh, I was supposed to end on the nose and I think I'll do exactly that. So thank you so much. And I look forward to conversation. Thank you. That was a really great contribution. There's one quick question I want to ask you, and then I'm going to open it up to the panel, um, which is you obviously you talked about growth, the importance of growth. Um, but do you think growth, as we've traditionally understood it, can actually continue when you're thinking about climate change? Is there going to be have, have to be a rethinking of what we mean by growth, what we understand by growth? Oh, absolutely. And I think, I'm sorry if I didn't make that patently clear. Um, that was a point that I wanted to make, which is where I agree with Professor Golden. We have to change and upgrade um, what, what and how we generate growth. But it, we have to also be realistic that we will not be able to achieve uh, the sorts of efforts that we're trying to achieve with the uh, climate, for example, without making sure that we're bringing people along in terms of living standards. I mean, in Western economies, particularly, people are very dogmatic around climate action, and that's fantastic. But, you know, if you start to ask people whether they're willing to sacrifice education or healthcare or their living standards in order to achieve this, I think the conversation very quickly becomes less constructive. So I think ultimately, yes, we need growth, but it's 
not at, at, at any and all costs. Um, and we didn't do growth the proper way before. So we do need to up, up, uh, upgrade it and update it to reflect social realities as well as climate, et cetera. Much. I'm going to take some questions that have come in to us uh, from all of you listening out there. So, Tom Hadley, first of all, who has uh, put his question via Zoom. What are the practical public policy measures needed to ensure that new opportunities linked to new skills needs and green jobs can make change happen on equality, social mobility and inclusion? Professor Golden. Panel with Deb Beaser again. It's been some time, and uh, I look forward to, <laughs> to being with you in person. Um, and just reinforce her point on growth. Uh, there can be no transition for climate change unless we invest, and investment leads to growth. So uh, the idea of having a sort of a, a zero growth climate transition is nonsensical. Um, the skills and investment that we need. Uh, are very wide ranging. Um, there's been a lot of uh, evidence from the US, interestingly enough, not least in Republican states, about this massive growth in jobs for people who are engaged in fitting renewables, in building renewables, uh, as it, but they, this requires new skill training. We need apprenticeship schemes. We need big investment and urgent investment in new capacity. There's a great shortage of the right sorts of people with the right skills. Uh, Brexit has compounded that. The question is, can we uh, build that domestically in the UK without more migrants? Uh, my thinking is we're going to need both. Uh, certainly in the short term, we're going to need both. And uh, this is something that needs to start lower down. The whole emphasis on university education, I'll say this as a professor at Oxford, uh, has gone too far. That we that somehow it's the only way to succeed in life. Your kids need to go to university, um, and we need a much wider. As it occurs in Germany, uh, particularly, but in some other European countries, a much wider respect uh, for other courses towards technical education in other areas. And of course, we need respect for things, some things which are not paid now, like home care work, uh, domestic work, and others. So we need to rethink about what it is. And this is going to be absolutely necessary because technological change, uh, robotics, automation, artificial intelligence are going to be taking a lot of repetitive rules-based tasks today. So we need to think about what can people do that machines won't do in the future and let's make sure we invest in those skills and give people the opportunities and the respect they need uh, to grow with those skills. Uh, Anita, I think the next question is really for you. It's from Joy Bolivant. She says, how do we use the new sense of community during COVID to bring about change to our approach, re-community health, especially mental health? Yes, I think this is one of the um, silver linings of the uh, pandemic. We've seen a massive increase in uh, people's willingness to volunteer, but also change in the conversation. So, for example, if I ask you, how are you today? I probably want to know now, and you're more inclined to answer it honestly <laughs> than, than, than we were before. And our interest in, in each other seems to have increased. I think it actually does lead a little bit, though, back to the questions about what na the nature of growth. Because one of the profound things that we've um, seen through the pandemic is people rethinking the relationship between work and the rest of their life, and the relationship between work and community and their existence in place. Um, and lots of organisations are now thinking about hybrid. We're seeing people thinking about where they want to live, about work-life balance and all those sorts of questions and wanting not just to see uh, care as something that has to be done in order to accommodate work and that work is central and the rest of our lives as being is, is apart from that and needs to be fitted in around that. So I think as we rethink growth, we rethink work, we rethink um, uh, what it means to be part of a, com a, a company, an organisation, um, our, the, our existence as a whole human being and our ability to contribute to our community, to be interested in each other's well-being. Many, many companies through this time have spent a lot of time thinking about the well-being of their employees and their employees' ability to contribute as well to, uh, to, to, to local um, initiatives. A lot of organisations gave people through the pandemic time to care, time to volunteer. So that feels like a conversation that I hope would take into reimagining um, <clears throat> not just um, how we deliver healthcare systems and work with communities, but also how work and other institutions recognise that people exist in communities.
interesting. There's some knitting that's gone on that uh, is quite unexpected. Now, I think the next one is for all of you. It's from Stephen Boxall. He says, we have a Conservative government doing things that a Labour government wouldn't have been allowed to do a few years ago. Why is this the case? The actions have been possible and are never impossible. Do the Conservative Party get an easy ride from a biased media? Ian Golden. I thought, I thought you were going to turn to Tambiso on this one. Um, but uh, the yes, they, I don't think it's the media that, that have given them an easy ride. The, what the government has done has been essential. Um, you know, they've, they've supported workers, uh, they've supported firms, they've um, done things. I think they, some things they shouldn't have done. They've, they haven't gone through proper procurement processes. That's because of urgency. But there has been a bit of buddy cronyism uh, giving you know, contracts to without competitive tender. So there needs to be much more competition, I think, and transparency around this. Uh, but uh, it's, I think it's, you know, crises call for different actions. And I think the government's done that same in the wars. Uh, the question is, will this be sustained? Uh, and I think something that Labour would not have done, which the Conservatives have done, uh, is, for example, roll back the universal credit. Uh, I think that was wrong. Uh, it's it's going to make the people that are already suffering terribly suffer more. Uh, some things have been forced into, partly by the media, but Marcus Rashford's done a very good thing in uh, on the school meals. Uh, so public pressure has allowed them also and made them do things they wouldn't have otherwise have done. So that is, I think, uh, important. But it's it's these these times the Conservatives would not have got away with it from their own members, from their own MPs, uh, let alone the public, to do these things in uh, January 2020. Sambisa, I wonder what you make of some of that uh, clothes swapping, if you like, between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. So, you know, I'm not a politician. I think it's really important to, for policy discussions. We should be pragmatic. Um, which is why I talked about the role of corporations and growth. But I worry again that this whole thing of, well, you know, they're changing their spots. I think um, what Professor Goldman just said is exactly right. We're in a crisis. I mean, the notion that you can be ideological when you're in the middle of a crisis to me seems crazy. Um, and in fact, if anything, my, my bigger concern is that we, do, we still did not come together even in a crisis. In fact, bigger uh, fissures were exposed. You couldn't even get agreement among Western democracies on how to deal with the, the pandemic, how to identify you know, what vaccines, what rollout. I mean, that to me is a bigger issue that, um, than, than sort of uh, essentially, I would call it maybe nickeling and diming on, on some of the, the policy stuff. I expect government to step in when there are market failures, when there are crises, when there are public goods challenges, and that's what we've been dealing with. So to me, to my mind, we shouldn't be surprised. Why, why ought we be surprised that government has stepped in? If anything, that's what they're there for. So um, I, I just um, I think that there are bigger issues that are at play here. Um, the whole discussion of you know the West versus China um, has been further exposed. In fact, there have been bigger problems exposed within um, the, the West, as I've alluded to a moment ago. And I think that those are the things that, to me, to my mind, the lack of unity geopolitically, economically, in terms of how to deal with crises, um, is a bigger issue to me than worrying about one policy or a couple of policies. I don't think that that really captures the weight of what, what we've learned. On this head, uh, Anita, is it too soon? We keep talking about a crisis. Is it actually too soon to make big decisions then? There's the dealing with the immediate crisis, which obviously uh, needs action. But actually, when you're thinking strategically about health or education or whatever, should we pause for a moment and take stock before we decide what to do? Well, uh, well we do need to uh, have a, a proper inquiry into COVID. Um, and, and learn the lessons, not least because whilst we hope we won't get anything quite like COVID and we hope we're moving from the pandemic phase, but we are still in the pandemic phase. Let's be very clear about this. And certainly if we think globally, we're still in the pandemic phase and large swathes of the world are not vaccinated uh, uh, yet. So we're not out of the woods. We're going to move from pandemic to endemic and we've got to learn how to live with this uh, disease for many years to come. But also, I think all the science, as I understand it, is that um, it is more likely now that we have 
these sorts of health shocks going forward. So it's really important that we don't go, treat this just as a truly exceptional one-off that we forget with the human desire to get back to normal and that we do do the proper inquiry. And an inquiry which isn't just about... There are some important questions about accountability. You know, it, just in the UK, over 100,000 people have lost their lives. So there's an important accountability. <clears throat> but it's really important within this to find a space to do a lessons learned, to think through how we prepare better for the future, and that we also do that with an international focus, because um, we are not safe in the UK while there is a global pandemic raging. And one of the things that I think has been truly sad has been the extent to which we've not thought enough internationally <clears throat> and the uh, failure to come together really to address the vaccine rollout globally has been something which globally we should hang our heads in shame over. Mm. Ian Golden, do you think it's too soon, perhaps, to, to make big decisions? You say you want a, a reset. You don't want things to go back to the way they were. I think uh, both you and Dambisa agree that's not necessarily what's going to happen anyway. But should we wait? Is there a moment to pause? No, to I, I, I don't think it is too soon because the lesson from history is that if you don't act when the crisis is really happening and when you still feel the pain of it and when you still recognize that the world is not right, uh, you don't act at all until it's, um, and you know, the complacency that comes in, uh, this is what happened after the first world war, the roaring twenties. There's, there's going to be a consumer boom. There really is. People are so excited to be able to party again, to be able to see friends, travel again, rightly so after the deprivations they've suffered. But the important thing is that they recognize that this is temporary unless we fix the problem. We're going to be in this cycle increasing, and uh, I, I absolutely agree. It's going to be an increasing cycle of instability because that's the nature of the butterfly defect. That's the nature of this complex dynamic system that we're in. And so unless we fix the fundamentals, we're in for a rougher and rougher ride. The roller coaster gets steeper and, you know, and, and more precipitous collapses. So that's, this is the time to do it, to really recognize and commit that if we don't want this to happen again, if we want a different world, then let's make some decisions. We don't have to work on the detail now, but we need to make the decisions. But that's what happened in the Second World War. That's when the United Nations, the Bretton Woods, and the Marshall Plan was created. That's when the welfare state was created. It was, you know, Beveridge was in 1942, in the midst of the war. There were literally bombs dropping on the buildings these people were working in. Um, and yet they didn't only fight but war on five fronts. They thought about the future and how do they stop this repetitive cycle? And that's the inspiration that I believe we need to take uh, at this time. And if we say, let's do it next year, the year after, I don't think it'll happen. Zambisa, one last thought from you. Uh, climate change is uh, an issue that is going to now really uh, go through everything that we think about. One of the policies that's been adopted by the EU is the idea of a carbon tax on products that come into the European Union. There are those who argue this is exactly what needs to be done if we're to recognize the costs of climate change. There are others who say all this is going to do is simply spark a global trade war as China and the United States react. Uh, do you think these are the issues in a way which might dampen global growth, might dampen the kind of cooperation that you've been saying is, is essential? So just to show my hand, I'm, I, I'm, I'm somebody who errs on the side of more transparency, not less. And the truth is, if you go back to sort of canonical models of economics, we have Coase's theorem, who says when there's a negative externality, somebody has to pay for it. If you just let it out there, nobody's paying for it. We, we end up where we are today. Um, where are we today? We're in a situation where we're producing 50 billion tons of, of emissions every year. And by the way, emissions have gone up while we've been sitting at home um, during COVID. Where are we today? We're, we're consuming 100 million barrels of oil every single day. Where are we today? A billion five people, 1.5 billion people around the world have no access to energy uh, in a clean way. So do, specific to carbon tax, I love transparency. Yes, let's ascribe that tax. But um, is this a simple solution? Of course it's not. I mean, people who are campaigning to defund 
energy companies are, are ignoring that they're Africans, you know, like my, my own continent of birth and, and Ian's as well, um, who, are, uh, who are desperately needing and wanting to get educated, to have the health care, improve their lives. And we're locking them out because we're not really understanding that there's a transition that needs to occur. And we are so heavily committed to the current um, situation. 80% of consumption is fossil fuels. That transition is going to be painful. It's going to be difficult. And if we're not clever, it's going to be costly. Um, and that's what we're trying to avoid. So I'm more about transparency here. Zambisa, Ian, Anita, thank you all very much. We're going to take a short break now, uh, but we'll be back at half past one when we'll be discussing making levelling up work uh, for the UK and for UK cities in particular. Thank you all for joining in and do keep those questions coming in. Welcome back, everyone, to the Center for Progressive Policy's Inclusive Growth Conference. I hope you had a good little break there. A reminder to those of you joining by Zoom, you can use the Q&A function to ask any questions you'd like to, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're also live streaming via YouTube on the website, and you can get in touch with us on Twitter using the hashtag IGConf2021. And we're also on Facebook Live, so please do get in touch. We really do want to hear from you. Our first topic now is uh, really going to get us stuck in, elbow deep, into the ideas that we want to take a good look at this afternoon. The topic is Beyond Roads and Railways, Making Leveling Up Work for Cities. Chairing it is Charlotte Aldrit, the director of CPP, and joining her on the panel are John Stevenson. He's the Conservative MP for Carlisle and co-chair of the APPG for Key Cities. Lord O'Neill, Jim O'Neill, is an economist and is vice chair of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, chair of Northern Gritston and a former commercial secretary to the Treasury. Julia Goldsworthy is a former Liberal Democrat MP and is now former Director of Strategy at the West Midlands Combined Authority, which uh, works to unlock the region's full economic potential for the benefit of everyone that lives there. I think, Charlotte, it's over to you. I'm going to leave you in charge. Thank you. So at CPP, we're interested in place. We think it's where these abstract ideas of productivity and even the, the very concept of the economy really plays out. It's where social and economic comes, policy comes together and, and, and lives for real. Um, cities were once all the rage, and Jim and I worked together um, several years ago now on the City Growth Commission. Um, they s have seemed to go out a little bit out of fashion since the 2019 election when um, Boris won a, a, a range of towns and, and a lot has been talked about towns. But I think we're going to get into a conversation uh, today about how important cities are to the government's macroeconomic agenda and, its contrib and their contribution to levelling mm. up, both in terms of the challenges that uh, they face and the opportunities that they present. So this session really reclaims the city and I'm delighted that we're connecting in with the Bristol Festival of Ideas as they think about the future city. So hello to everybody um, in Bristol that's joining in for this session here today. So we are very much awaiting the government's levelling up white paper. We've obviously got the budget and the spending review next week and we're certainly hoping to hear more on what levelling up is, what the government's going to do about it and how much money it's going to put behind it. So um, I think that's a, a great way of then handing over to um, our Conservative MP for Carlisle, John, who's going to tell us a little bit more about um, what he's experienced and seen in his city and, and what he's expecting from that white paper. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Charlotte, and delighted to be here. Um, I'd like to start my remarks actually talking about the city we're in, London. I think we recognise London as a world city. It is hugely successful. But I think the real success of London is actually how it has influenced the places around it, how the economic success of London has permeated out to other parts of the south. And what I would like to see ultimately is the other cities of this country doing something similar. So you've got Manchester, Leeds, seeing those being so successful that it again permeates out to other parts of the area that they are in. And if you go to a smaller scale, my own constituency and city of Carlisle, there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be the economic driver for that region. The problem, as I think we've all uh, acknowledged, is our cities have not been as successful as they could be. London, yes, and maybe Bristol and some others have been 
fairly successful, but I think we need to see the other cities step up and become far more uh, dynamic and um, successful economically and beyond. Leveling up agenda is very much part of government's policy. It was a key part of the 2019 manifesto. Everybody argues, what is leveling up all about? For me, it's two very simple things. First of all, it's about improving people's lives. And secondly, it's about closing the gap between other parts of the country and indeed London and the South. It is about moving up, leveling up. How do we go about doing that? Well, if you go back actually to the origins of levelling up, which in many respects was the Northern Powerhouse concept, which George Osborne set out in 2014 and which Jim was very much part of, it's about connectivity, it's about improving the connections between particularly the, the cities. I take a northern perspective very much about the connectivity between places like Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds and across to the east. But it's also about skills, it's about in the environment, it's about devolution, and it's also about private sector investment. So I think those are the, 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 the areas where I think we need to see improvement. The challenge to government, I think, is primarily threefold. It is first that improving skills, not so much at the university element, but very much at the school, the technical, the college element. And it cannot be seen in isolation, because I think the great risk is you improve the skills in the north of England, for example, and what happens, unless the jobs are there, they'll all head off to London and the South in the first place because that's where the opportunities are. So we've got to make sure that we have joined up thinking here. So skills undoubtedly is going to be one of the primary um, drivers of change in the North. But combine that also with devolution. We have to accept we are an over-centralised country. We need to decentralise powers, give communities and leaders in those communities real powers to do things in their locality. Mayors, I think, are a great vehicle for achieving that. I think we're starting to see that being demonstrated by Andy Burnham in Manchester, Ben Houchen in the north, Andy Street in the Midlands. And I think expanding the concept of mayors out would be very beneficial, but it's also got to be combined with real powers and real devolution. And then the third equation is private sector investment. At the end of the day, it is they that create the wealth, the jobs, the opportunities. But the, gov the challenge to the government is how do you actually incentivise businesses not necessarily to come to London in the south, but to look to invest elsewhere. And I give a very simple example of my own constituency. We have a Pirelli plant. It's been there 50 years. It was a direct consequence of economic policy of the government 50 years ago. But for the last 50 years, we've had 400 to 500 million pounds of benefit going into our local economy because of that, creating 800 well-paid skilled jobs. So we've got to look at how we can incentivise the private sector to come as well, along with the skills and along with the devolution. And I think those are the three key factors that can deliver, I think, a better balanced country. Wonderful. Thanks, John. Um, Jim, I know that education is something close to your heart, education yeah. and skills. Yeah. But levelling up for you. I mean, just a couple of things before I answer that question. Um, I, I, I like how you introduced uh, the issues and, and it does seem, for reasons that seem a bit weird to me, that there's a shift away from big cities, but I detect at the margin a bit of a shift back, which I hope I'm right about because it's really important. Uh, from, a, from as you and I showed and all our team in the Cities Growth Commission report, unless you can really influence the growth performance of the, you know, the 14 places in the UK that have more than half a million people, you can't improve the national economic performance. Irrelevant of how many small towns you try and help. I think there is some fresh realisation of that and I hope I'm right. Uh, I have to say, secondly in this regard, John I want to again say publicly what, what John's done uh, about some of the, the dilemmas about areas that aren't thought about when you focus on cities with the so-called borderlands has been a fantastic uh, thing that I think in itself uh, should be, uh, given what they're achieving, uh, a stimulus to how others should think about how to approach credible ways of trying to do this. On your question, yeah, uh, you know, what, uh, what the hell is levelling up? Uh, you know, we'll find out perhaps when this much, yet another much delayed white paper finally comes out, uh, but maybe we won't. Um, but of all the things that are uh, relevant, and I take it for granted, 
a lot of it will be place-based. Uh, there's an intellectual case for saying maybe the, a lot of it shouldn't be, but it will be. Um, ultimately, I believe it should be about educational opportunity. And especially if you look at the, the long, long-term uh, deep-seated problems about regional inequalities in this country, you can trace a lot of them, or they seem to have an enormous correlation with educational underperformance. Parts of the Midlands, uh, actually probably more the East than the West, and across, not, not everywhere in the North. The North is kind of very intriguing this way. There's huge diversity, but in a good 30 plus areas, unless you give devoted attention to educational challenges there, you're not going to make a difference. And so uh, the two things that I plead for, and I'm, frankly I'm not sure it is something the government yet really realises, is a much more serious approach to so-called opportunity areas, which needs a refresh anyhow, where they're trying to deal with best practice on what actually might work and linking it away from the schoolroom to parental uh, stimulus about aspects of all of this. Uh, and then... Uh, Secondly, the, the pupil premium as to how, which you guys have done a very uh, important paper on recently, uh, it's a dear central thing to what Northern Powerhouse Partnership has been trying to preach for a while now, that they need to change the definition of it to the, the time length that a child is eligible, because that's a much better indication of true level of exclusion, uh, and it's along with everything else that it even goes back to the brief time I was in government. The guy at the centre, which in this case is Boris, has to tell all these different departments, you do not have a choice about opting in or out, you're in. And the Department of Education in particular needs to be stopped from thinking, you know, we're, we're a bit removed from all of this, we're above it all, because otherwise we won't get anywhere. Devolution, obviously central to it all. I, I would... It's very much away from the current thinking, but I would, I would personally believe, linked to the aspects of what I've said, bringing some parts of schooling back to having devolved capability, I think, ultimately is a sensible thing to do. Thank you. So educational attainment, closing that gap, and the role of devolution, two sustained themes. Julia, I'm guessing you might not disagree too much with those things, but now that you're, um, you've left the West Midlands, maybe you, uh, you can inject a bit of controversy for us. And I think also, <laughs> as someone who spent a bit of time in the Treasury when devolution did feel like it was one of the priorities at the Treasury, so I thought maybe just talk a bit about some of the baggage that this whole agenda is, is trying to unpick. Some of it is political, I think. Some of it is actually institutional and about the bureaucracy as well. It's part of the psychology of some of the way that departments work. Um, so I think before even you get to the 20 2019 election and the kind of red wall came to the fore and this kind of tension between is it towns or cities was brought out. It felt that devolution was in potentially quite a difficult space. Um, it was highly transactional. It was encouraging cities to compete against one another. Um, that's even before this whole, is it, you know, it's towns that are flavour of the month rather than cities. And in places like the West Midlands that aren't monocentric, you know, they've got multiple cities with ecosystems of towns that support them. They're all one kind of economic geography. It's not things that need to compete against each other. I think we've created this environment where a combination of the short term tactical politics of being able to almost in a port barrel way say look this is what we're delivering for a this government is specifically delivering for this specific place I think the combination of that and the psychology that, that Jim was talking about where kind of departments are also quite protective of their fiefdoms means that kind of where the broader inclusive growth the leveling up agendas has been quite atomized and you can absolutely see that in um the delay to the levelling up white paper, um, the delay to the shared prosperity fund details, which was supposed to be this kind of unifying agenda, but you know we'll find out next week whether it will deliver that or whether it will be a ribbon around another fragmented um, bunch of funding. Um, I mean, even with yesterday's net zero strategy, actually, you know, really, really great to see the level of ambition. I still don't quite understand where the handoff is between. Um, the national actions that are going to need to be taken and the commitments that are being made at a place-based level to deliver on their commitments. So still lots more thinking that needs to be um, kind of unpicked 
really, and, and spelled out. And you know, we're in a place where the defaults are highly transactional. They're targeted. They're competitive funding applications. I mean, look at the transport, the Intercity Transport Fund again as well. Originally vaunted as a kind of devolved fund that would help unlock the infrastructure, moving very much towards a place of kind of you know send us your bids and central government will tell you how it you know what how we think it stacks up so it's like i think the the key question is what do we collectively need to do to kind of reach escape velocity from from that kind of environment and you know there are lots of reasons to be quite pessimistic i've talked about them the the way the system is atomized um the public it's quite interesting when you look at the polling because they will simultaneously say leveling up is the most important agenda to deal with but at the same time are highly highly cynical about um not really understanding what it means (laughs) and kind of a default starting point of being quite cynical about the government's commitment to it. And I think the reason why it's so important that we try and find that escape velocity is because, as you know, as, as everyone has already said, we are a country that's deeply centralised. We have deeply ingrained inequalities, not just between regions, but within them as well. And all of them are now in the context of, you know, a once in 100 years health crisis and a once in 300 years economic crisis. We know that inequalities are being cast in even starker relief. So if not now, then when are we going to do it? The reasons to be hopeful, um, I think the jigsaw pieces are starting to fall into place. Personally, I think it's a great thing that we've got Michael Gove at the helm of the department kind of giving kind of, I don't know, a heavyweight sense to a department that has always struggled to have cross-government traction. He will absolutely be a radical reformer. Some parts of the system might not like that, but he will absolutely be radical. And I think that combined with bringing in Andy Haldane, bringing in Neil O'Brien, and actually having Simon Clark at the Treasury to bring them in too, you know, you can see that there are people that absolutely get that. You know, when Michael Gove in his conference speech talked about his kind of definition <coughs> of levelling up, it absolutely ticks the right boxes in terms of engaging local leaders and communities, in terms of bringing in the private sector, in terms of public services reform being an important part of that agenda and bringing back pride of pride of place. All of those things are absolutely right. We're just at a point where we can't quite see how it's going to translate into reality. Like when we get to next week's spending review, is the Treasury going to break down the silos between different departments and show how this is a systems level approach? Are they going to show that they're going to put money into the public services reform agenda because you have to enable people to unlock their potential, not just through kind of education and skills, but actually I think public health is a really important route in, in terms of unlocking economic potential as well. You know, those are really big questions and I haven't seen that direction of travel yet of like how that's going to play out in some of those really important proof points that to come. So in terms of like, you know, what can different places do, what can central government do, I think for everyone kind of not losing sight of the citizen being at the heart of all of this for them it's not just about kind of the things that they can point to that create pride in their places fundamentally is a big economic question of do I feel better off delivering level up in the context of rising inflation it's going to be really really hard not underestimating the scale of that challenge and I think thinking about leveling up as a shared national mission that everyone has a responsibility to deliver at a neighborhood community town city region nationally that national mission I think we can all we should be trying to buy into and I think even before we get into um, arguments about where power and resource should lie there needs to be a space where places and government can have a shared conversation around what does this place need to succeed? What are all of the public resources and private resources that we can put kind of in the mix to help unlock that? And it it just feels at the moment, we've got a set of processes that make having that holistic conversation really, really difficult. Mayors are absolutely um, kind of uh, a lightning rod to bring those conversations together, but how do we formalize it into the system so it just doesn't get atomized as it goes through Whitehall? and I think Treasury has to get in there, understand it moves beyond competitive. You know, how do they use the fiscal levers that they have to have those cross-cutting conversations? Um, you know, and that ultimately do get us into fiscal devolution. And then finally, for places, I think, you know, when I think about uh, my time at the West Midlands, um, levelling up isn't a new concept. It's, you know, the kind of inclusive growth concept is the thing that brought everybody to the table and I think it's kind of not losing sight of that not drinking the Kool-Aid and getting sucked into spending a lot of time kind of putting energy into very small scale bids but understanding that actually there's a huge amount of resources that they can control and influence and how do they work effectively in their own place-based systems 
um, to use those resources effectively, basically. So, like, what can we all do to make it a national mission rather than it kind of being reduced down into quite a polarised political debate, which I think would be the key thing that we really have to focus on. Thank you. Well, huge food for thought from um, all of our speakers. I think if I could just start on the devolution question. Um, I've been really struck by the degree of consensus across the centre-left, centre-right media, policy, community, commentariat, you know, whether it's the FT, the Times or whoever it might be, all calling for greater devolved powers to mayors, local council leaders, etc., etc., the role of regional government, northern powerhouse and its equivalents. And yet, we had that delayed slash binned um, devolution local recovery white paper. There's been a kind of existential kind of angst in government over the recent months as to the extent to which um, whilst I think place is going to be key, is that going to translate into more power and resources being devolved down or is, or is there going to be a kind of centralised version of place-based policy making? What do you think are the blockers in, and how long do you think the government can kind of last out against that wave of people demanding that this surely has to be the way that we can achieve levelling up? Um, Julia, and then working back through, do you, do you have a sense of what those blockers are? I think I do think some of it is political. So I think the fact that you know we have ten mayoral combined authorities and eight of those combined authorities return Labour mayors does make it quite difficult. I think so. I think government, but also the M10, have to think about what that means for what their shared priorities are, what are the things that they can agree on, um, and just kind of not get sucked down to the lowest common denominator to the point of being meaningless. I do think that some of it is institutional as well because. The, the reality of this very, very atomised system means that it's actually really, really hard to put all the pieces back up together and articulate the added value that kind of a place-based approach delivers. So just as an example, um, the five-year gateway review on the gain share, that process is only interested in a conversation around what the gain share in particular has delivered in terms of outcomes. Um, it's kind of for the broader conversation to try and say, well, actually, it's not just what this funding alone has delivered, it's what it's leveraged, bringing in other resources. So the, the risk is that government can be very specific about holding to account very individual tiny pots. It's a struggle on both sides to then demonstrate, not even that it adds up to more than the sum of the parts, but even what the sum of the parts is. Mm. Um, so that's where I think... You know, it's the systems and processes are as important as the kind of personality and the politics in terms of creating barriers to, to kind of moving this agenda forward, I think. I'd say three things, really, uh, two of which, two political things. First of all, uh, you know, the, the sort of obsession with the national tribal colour. I mean, you know, I, I went into Treasury to try and deliver on a lot of this and the obstinacy of of both sides about which political party the mayor might be struck me as nuts, but it, it's lived on to this day. And it, obviously it's completely against the spirit of devolution to having an obsession about that, but it's, that's unfortunately some kind of real politics. The second one is even more annoying, is that in, inside uh, the Tory leadership, uh, it jumps from once, even though the same government essentially ran the country for it was it, 11 years, you know, Theresa May would not allow the phrase Northern Powerhouse to be used simply because it was theirs. One of the reasons why this government talks levelling up is because it doesn't like George Osborne. I mean, it's pathetic, frankly. And the, if they're serious, they've got to get away from that kind of petty nonsense. It's their own party. Um, the third thing is also, in many ways, equally frustrating, but it's a bit more a combination of awareness and, and real passion. So quite a lot of the, and this goes way beyond the politicians, this is the, the bureaucratic system. There are, there are very few people that actually really ever look at any objective evidence of what's going on regionally. And, and the, there are one or two bits of evidence that some of this stuff might have worked a little bit, but you try talking to anybody around this square mile about that, and they haven't a clue what you're talking about. And so it's like, what is the matter with you all? Is it you just don't basically really believe that any initiative about anything will ever work? Which sometimes 
might be real in their heads. It's like, get real, you know. If, it's, if you really want to be in leveling up, get excited on it and really focus on what you're going to measure and look at some of the things that already have happened under a different name that might actually have, a, have an influence. And you might feel good about it. I can see it. <laughs> yeah, it was just more in, like this kind of confusion that like control, central control doesn't equal agency. Um, right. And I think that's where kind of the pandemic probably made things a bit worse as well because there was this sense that like we can't control, you know, unless we can control everything, we can't guarantee right. it's going to happen. Which really delivered success, right? Um, whereas actually, um, you know, there are some really great examples where kind of just sharing information giving a little bit more control regionally does, doesn't mean there's a lack of transparency. It just means there can be more effective collaboration and impact. And I think sometimes it's quite difficult to, to kind of land that point in a world where even with, you know, an ambitious agenda about moving Whitehall departments out into the different regions of the country, a lot of senior civil servants spend a very small amount of time visiting places outside central London. And, and like sometimes just don't even understand the basic geography. And even within departments, you know, can't join things up. So <laughs> the West Midlands is hosting... Where is Carlisle? You know, City of Culture, <laughs> Commonwealth Games, a 5G pilot, all within one department. And it can be really hard to have a joined up conversation about how those things can come together and, and kind of leverage impact, let alone do that outside, you know, across departments. Well, John, I know you've had um, some pretty good success in... in uh, in getting some of those different fragmented pots of funding. How are you trying to find a way to bring that together so that you can you know, use the, those different monies to deliver your strategic objectives as a city? Well, I, I'd say three things, two things in your original question and one in that latter question. Um, I agree politics has got in the way and it's politics within my party and it's politics within the Labour Party and it's also a conflict between politics nationally and locally. And it's quite interesting if you speak to a lot of the local mayors, they have far more cross-party collaboration and they have far more discussions with other parties. Well, nationally, it's very tribal. It's very, you know, government mm. in opposition and it's quite confrontational. Well, actually, the mayors, I think, are the conversations I've had with mayors, they're indicating it's far more collaborative. And I think that's personally a very healthy thing. The other interesting thing I think is civil service. They do not really want to see decentralization. And yes, you, you Julie highlights the point about moving departments out. It's not the policy makers, it's not the decision makers. It's, uh, and that's not going to change anything. But on the local level, it's very interesting. One of the great frustrations of being a backbench MP after 11 years is you get to know ministers in a particular department, you're starting to work with local issues, mm -hmm. and then bang, they're gone. And you start all over again, and it's utterly frustrating. Well, actually, at the local level, you've got um, yeah. chief executives and officers who've been there for five, ten years. They know what's going on locally. You've built up a relationship with them. And actually, you probably achieve more. And you've asked me specifically about Carlisle example. Over the last 10 years, I've had a Conservative leader and a Labour leader of the council. But broadly speaking, I've had the same officers. And we've worked together across the political divide, across the administrative um, divide as well. Uh, and they've been, I think, excellent. And it's because of that sort of continuity that we've managed to do, I think, quite a lot in Carlisle. Um, when I look at the national scene, when I've had ministers constantly changing, it's very, very frustrating when you're trying to achieve things with them. Well, actually, at the local level, quite often you can achieve things quite quickly and quite successfully because there's that continuity. So I think there's a number of issues. I mean, politics does get in the way. We can't get away from that. But I think if we could keep pushing on and demonstrate to government that it actually works at the local level, once they start to realise that, and I'm hoping Michael Gove is going to be the catalyst for the great change. I mean, I was hugely disappointed when um, George Osborne left because he had been the initial driver of all this. I just hope uh, Michael Gove takes up the, the baton and runs with it because if he can't do it, I'm not sure anybody can. Well, we've talked about power, um, but I want to come to money next. We've touched on it a bit there. Jim, obviously, we've got the budget and the spending review mm -hmm. next week. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of pressure on the Chancellor to kind of demonstrate his fiscal conservativeness 
Um, we're obviously awaiting the OBR projections yeah. um, and, and a few kind of competing bits of data that are coming in as to what the UK's economic outlook is going to be. <coughs> but, you know, we calculated, for example, you mentioned the, the pupil premium in the report that we did with the Northern Research Group. We calculated that um, we could spend an extra two billion on expanding the eligibility for the pupil premium so that the, the bottom 40% of households would be covered right. um, to, to receive that additional money. Yep. Everyone's putting in their SR bids. To what extent are you hopeful that the government will focus things that um, you know, can be um, loosely called social infrastructure, that preventative health, yeah. the educational attainment that, that you were talking about, as much as or, or more so potentially than kind of the more traditional capital intensive projects that yeah. particularly this government has become yeah. keen on? Well, we'll see, right? Um, I mean, it is really important. That it's the first multi-year spending review we've had for quite some time. And... Uh, you know, I'm trained in the, that's probably a better guide to what a government's really serious about than the budget itself. So it's big. Um, listen, uh, what I get irritated just listening to your very <laughs> informed, no, it's, it's in respect of what you've, you've researched on. As I said earlier, I think the education reform or the mental approach to education changes that are needed are probably the most important ultimately and what is so frustrating is they don't cost that much and you just highlighted it with your definition of pupil premium that's amongst the reoccurring things as to why it is so annoying but you know and, and here there's a contradiction with, with Michael Gove because of course Michael in his life as the Department of Education sort of set the mantra for this centrally run academy based system and you know that has its pluses and weaknesses, but it, it, over a decade later, it is not dealing with the most challenged places educationally, and we've got to get out of that. So some of it's nothing to do with the money, it's here. Mm. Uh, and, and, but when you come to the relative numbers, um, the numbers that are really needed to make a big difference over the long term in education are, are relatively small, you know, compared to 100 billion for HS2. You know, the, the productivity benefits, dr particularly post-COVID, in my, in my view, dramatically more. Dramatically more. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I often change my... You know, I think Rishi himself occasionally gets this. But you have a prime minister that's obsessed about big projects. Um, and a machine... Partly because of the way the PM handles himself, institutionally and understandably is slightly obsessed about the, you know, the magic money tree and does have some obligation to say, we can't just spend on everything persistently. So it's a, you know, it's a tricky ball, the, the, the juggling here, but you know, we're going to find out pretty soon. Mm -hmm. John, did you want to uh, I mean, I'm an enthusiastic supporter of the pupil premium because it has actually demonstrated it has uh, improved an awful lot of yeah. people's lives. And two billion in the greater scheme of things is not a Penals. hugely significant amount of money. And I agree wholeheartedly that education is the main driver to improve people's lives. Um, and, but I think we've also got to be careful of where the education, partly at school, but we've also got to look at colleges. Yeah, we've yeah. also got to look at what the local economy demands. Because you know, I look at my own local economy, it's more about engineers, technicians, <laughs> rather than a huge number of university graduates. Well, other parts of the economy will need university graduates. And I think actually at the university level, we're in a pretty good place, generally. But I think it's uh, school education, technical education, college education, that's where I think the emphasis should be. Yeah, I, I suppose the importance of capital infrastructure shouldn't be kind of just brushed to one side in terms of connecting places and communities to economic opportunity is really really important i fear a bit for public services um, i think you know from a, an education point of view the devolution of the adult education budget has shown that that kind of regional approach has been much better able to connect Did it finally happen is it finally well, happen but you know but then but you need to be able to do more earlier in this like you know what's yeah. next how do you make the case for what's next whether it's careers um, post ex, you know for, for younger age groups how do you go down and I, I just fear for I fear for broader public services because for me 
um, a lot of this kind of broader leveling up agenda as opposed to a very narrow one is about um, investment in early intervention. And, you know, local government has been at the sharp end of really, really tough spending rounds for the last 10 years. And, you know, as someone sat in the coalition government as a special advisor for the people premier, absolutely has made a difference, fundamental difference. But um, local government is being pinned down to their statutory responsibilities only. So where is the space to innovate, to support early intervention? That's the bit that I fear for. There is a bit of space for that in mayor or combined authorities, they, they're less constrained by those statutory responsibilities. But for me, that's the bit where I, it just feels like that's going to be hugely at risk in a multi-year spending round. Um, and, and I think that is a concern for delivering on that much broader agenda. Well, speaking of risk, I mean, it's, it's, it's risks that the, the Whitehall need to take on. I mean, you mentioned the adult education budget and the devolution of that. You know, very, very small amounts of money. Um, other, other aspects it might be nominally devolved, but if you're compounding that by, you know, cuts to local government budgets, you're sort of tying places' hands behind their back before you can really then demonstrate the efficacy of, of devolution and, and the rest. And you need a proper conversation around fiscal devolution. You know, they've, mm-hmm. it's, right. for the last 10 years, it's been very much at the margins of, well, if Blame, we come up with any new taxes that we're not that bothered about collecting. But, it, you know, it's, a, it's about the sustainability of public finances, not just nationally, but kind of in those place-based systems as well. And unless you're prepared to put fiscal devolution on the table, then again, the parameters are just really, really tightly defined. It's really difficult to get any wiggle room. Well, let's explore that a little bit more because, I mean, one of the big questions is how do we pay for all this stuff? And, um, you know, we've seen that there's been a, an increase in national insurance contributions linked to um, tackling um, waiting lists in, in the NHS and then ultimately in social care. Um, Jim, I remember a programme you did for Radio 4 a few mm. months ago that was talking about potentially shifting to a Scandinavian type model. And, you know, many people um, within the Conservative Party or on the right more generally, and noting John here, here today interested in your views, would say, well, taxes are at record high levels, so there's not that much further to go. What would you say to that? Actually, I've got uh, an even more radical thing that maybe didn't come out in that programme. You know, from a, from a 40,000 foot macro perspective, what this crisis so far has demonstrated is all con- conventional post-war, post-World War II or since the IMF was established 50 years ago, thinking on what is worrying levels of debt have been blown apart. And so what I really think is needed, which is not going to happen anytime soon, but we have the beginnings of thinking about it, is, is a much more sophisticated approach to the accounting of government spending in two ways. One is, let's call it a modern version of the Gordon Brown golden rule, in in which you truly separate in almost every department other than Treasury, what is investment spending and what is current consumption spending. And I think the markets, if it was done rigorously all around the world, and the IMF approved for it, the markets would be perfectly at ease with that because it's the investment spending that creates, to put it in economics parlance, the multiplier effects. And in the way the world is, most of my adult life, and it's now probably going to be worse, as you touched on in some areas, you know, it's the easiest bit to crush because you save quick money there and nobody worries about the consequences because I might not be in power. And we've got to get out of that. Second thing, which is particularly valid for us, which again, another part of the have seen some Scandinavians think about this, and the current head of the OBR has done some interesting thinking about it as well, so it's maybe creeping more into debate, is, is actually trying to value some of our assets uh, that come from public expenditure as opposed to just regarding them as nothing. Because we've got to get out of this mental framework uh, of what is essentially an accounting game and it, it's, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to have been a 45-year-old student of economics when I think how, how narrow-minded we've become about it all. On the tax thing, very quickly, you know, the, the most interesting thing to me in this regard is that the, the hostile opposition to tax increases that has been there also most of my adult life isn't there in opinion polls anymore, which is which might only be temporary, but it's not, it's, not, it's not people clamoring for 
you know, boot, raise my taxes. But the hostility against it, it's not there for the first time in 30 years. But I would love to see something a lot more on the first part of that. As, you know, in, in departments like health and in, in things that relate to this leveling up agenda, unless you do it that way, you can never get out of this bananas narrow accounting framework. Don, I have to come to you for yeah. your thoughts. Well, interesting enough, at present, I think 95% of all taxes are raised nationally. Yeah. And I just think the balance between central government and local government is completely out of sync. And if you look at all the other countries, European countries and America, it is a very different balance. And I would like to see a shift so that you actually have not just powers given to local communities right. and local leaders, but also responsibility. So they do actually have to think about right. what they're going to spend their money on because they've got to raise it locally as well. And I think that, that gives greater responsibility to those leaders. But the other thing I think we're missing here slightly, and we mustn't lose sight of it, we need to actually grow our economy. And the way, <laughs> you know, if we grow our economy, a lot of these problems will start to disappear. And the balance between London, as we started our conversation with today, and other cities in the north and other parts of the country, that gap has to be closed. And if we close that gap, it will improve the overall balance within our national economy. It will raise an awful lot more funding through taxation, etc. And it will improve the lives of those communities that at present are, in my view, underperforming. Yeah. I just want to bring in um, two questions that we've had from um, our audience um, before we then um, go to final thoughts from everyone on the panel. Um, so there's one question from Stephen Boxall via Zoom, thank you, um, about the relative importance between connectivity within cities versus connectivity between cities. And I know when we were doing City Growth Commission, that was, a, that was one major aspect that we yeah. looked at. But from your West Midlands perspective, yeah. that's something I, I know will be, um, uh, that will resonate. And then, John, you, you touched there on, on the idea of community and the importance of communities. Um, our second question from Kate Hainsworth, again via Zoom, is around um, the community sector, the voluntary sector, and um, civil society. You know, we talk about local leadership, but how does this connect to real people on the ground and, and get them involved in thinking about this as well? So, Julia, and then we'll do final thoughts from each of yeah, so I think I think I mentioned it before, really, but like it's not to kind of play down the importance of capital infrastructure. It's just it's necessary but not sufficient. And again, thinking not just at the importance of HS2 in unlocking growth for the broader West Midlands, but actually that um, broader intra-regional transport next um, connectivity that's going to be so important to connecting the communities in a region to where there is economic opportunity. Um, the question around communities, it really makes me think about a lot of the work that went on into supporting the Community Renewal Fund um, at one level where, again, it's really, really, uh, this atomization of the system is actually a barrier, I think, to getting communities um, engaged and it needs to be properly again it's one of those things that it needs to be properly invested in and there has been some really great work in loads of different places um, into in the broader community recovery from the pandemic that I think you know gives us some really good um, case studies to work from and then just a final point on this kind of fiscal devolution you know, with the mayor or combined authorities there is a point of accountability um, if that's what central government are, right. are worried about and I would just say the other thing to bear in mind is it's not just the the scepticism about kind of the revenue raising it's um, the calculation around kind of invest to save not just from a capital point of view and the work on the green book is really important starting to shift the dial but also in public services as well and I just think we need to be spending more energy in showing how that upstream intervention is generating savings further down the line and then how do you capture that in kind of fiscal planning and I don't think we do that as a country very effectively at the moment so and there's an opportunity to commercialize that as well if we get it right so I think that's where we need to to spend some time to try and unlock the resource. Well, and then a minute each, please. Jim. Listen, well, the first of those two questions um, depends where in the country you're talking about. I, I, um, if I was forced to not have that caveat, it would be within cities. Because I think about, you know, the best way of answering it, Manchester's GVA, Manchester itself's GVA has outperformed London the, the past six years collectively, but Greater Manchester hasn't. So it's got to be better connection to the towns around it, both locally and further. But in the same breath, uh, to make a true difference, going right back to the core of what the Cities Growth Commission was all about, because you happen to have in the north of England 
so many places so close together. If you can create a proper economic unit, that is a national British game changer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And finally, John. I mean, building on that point, it's like building a counterweight to London, isn't it? Yeah. So you've actually got two economic centres, yeah. both of which are performing at a national level. So, I mean, I completely agree with that. I, I would summarise three key things, which I said at the outset. Skills and education <coughs> are very important. Devolution, I think, is the, one of the game changers because I think that changes the dynamics. Uh, and you can't get away from the fact private sector investment is so important because ultimately it's the private sector that's the wealth creators and it's through private sector success that you get the taxes that pay for our public services. But it's those three things and I think they're all challenging for the government because at present uh, private sector investment tends to go to you know, Cambridge, Oxford, yep. uh, London. How do you incentivise it to, to other parts stone. of the country? Um, skills, putting serious money into it and then being brave with devolution, being brave. Well, we've got to end there, but I think there's a call on government to be brave on devolution, spend in education and skills, get its own house in order and think about its internal system reform and how that can really un unlock all of these things. I think we've shown that cities have their place on the map. Uh, and justifiably so, but we need to think more in terms of kind of wider functional economic, economic geography and the complexity of our um, urban rural um, economic geographies. And then I think finally, I would just end to say, you know, we're all waiting for this uh, levelling up white paper. Um, we're all waiting for the SR and, and the budget next week. But we're already seeing places that are getting on and doing and making the most of what they've got, working with the private sector, working with their local universities and other networks, um, be those grassroots or otherwise, to make their places better for their citizens. And uh, that's what gives me hope. So thanks so much for joining this session. And thank you to our fantastic speakers, Juliet, Jim and John. Thank you. Thank you.
other things apart from simply reduction of CO2 because that's where we need to be able to change these things. If we simply spend our time talking about reduction of CO2, and I know I've, I've talked about this a lot, a, a lot with Caroline over the years, is that if we only talk about CO2, for most people, that is something that is happening somewhere else to someone else. And they still need to be making sure that they can afford the bills and afford to be able to have a comfortable um, and affordable life and an interesting and, and, uh, and, and uh, life in which they can fulfill their ambitions for themselves and their children. While you've got people who increasingly cannot afford insurance on their homes or their businesses, um, for example, because of the risks of increased flooding, again, something that's happened not only in places like South Yorkshire, but Cumbria, Leeds, Manchester and elsewhere, we know we need to be making these things a reality for people now. And we therefore need to be thinking about this, not just in terms of CO2, but also well, health and well-being, as well as jobs and prosperity. So this enables us to have a conversation, particularly in the context of place and about local government, about transforming services as well as the economy. The point I make quite often when I'm talking to Chris Stark, for example, the chief executive of the um, Committee on Climate Change, is that it's all very well talking about more electric buses. But if an electric bus only appears once a day in the same way that the dirty bus used to, it isn't increasing the quality of the service here and now for people. And it's barely improving health either. Knocking out one dirty bus and replacing it with one clean one makes a big difference when you've got lots of buses somewhere like London where you don't have lots of um, public transport. Investing in public transport to be integrated, affordable, reliable, safe, secure, and clean is really important. And thinking about how you make sure that your transformation isn't simply about knocking out the CO2, but providing better services in a way that meets the needs of your communities now is crucial. And definitely a way of building the public consent and support. Because right now, although people will say that the, what the government announced yesterday wasn't nearly enough, what is happening is the easy stuff. There's so much more to be done. I'd like to make one point, though, that was really disappointing about yesterday, and that's the um, that's the Treasury's review. The words I think that are worthwhile quoting are ones that we have to have real concern about. They It says in the review, seeking to pass the costs onto future taxpayers through borrowing would not be consistent with intergenerational fairness nor fiscal sustainability. This could also push up the economic cost of transition. This is literally the opposite of the situation when it comes to this. We paid off our war debt in 2006. This is literally the thing we should be spending money on to save money later and to pass on a livable world to the next generation. This isn't just about spending lots of taxpayers' money. It's about shaping and creating markets, making sure that there is both supply and demand and, and falling costs for consumers as well as opportunities for jobs. Ultimately, a just transition to the net, to net zero means that we can align the two things that this government say that they are interested in um, into something which could be a national mission to level up and to tackle climate change. That should be the, strat the test for the strategy that was published yesterday. And it should be the test also of what all local government does when they're looking at whether they are able to um, play their role as well successfully in achieving net zero in this country. Thank you very much. Some great thoughts there to get us going. Let's now hear from Simon. Simon Hansen. Well, uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, I also want to thank uh, the Centre for Progressive Policy for inviting me here today to discuss such an important topic. Um, and maybe I could start by saying I agree a lot with the point that Polly just made, that this is not just about delivering emissions-free services and creating a society where we are not relying on fossil fuels. It's ultimately about developing a much better society with healthier, better jobs, with uh, healthier and better services, a society where everyone can really flourish. And I think there is a huge risk in the climate crisis because there's this urgency. We really need to bring down the CO2 emissions. And because science is so very clear on what needs to happen, not just across the board, but also within different sectors, it's very tempting to devise our policies purely from what we learn, what we know must happen and sometimes forget that in the short term there can be costs to what we're doing and those costs are not necessarily distributed evenly across different segments of society 
Some people are more relying on their cars in their everyday lives than others. Some people, like Polly also mentioned, they maybe make a living by repairing cars. You know, lots of people will be asking themselves very relevant and natural questions. What does this mean for me? And therefore, I think this whole issue of making sure that this transition is not just quick and efficient in terms of bringing down emissions, but that ultimately it's just and that it creates a society that in both social and economic terms uh, is much more equitable, I think that's really essential. And the good news, the way I see it, um, and having worked with C40 cities, where I've worked with some of the biggest cities across the globe uh, for many years, the good news is that cities, this is really the strategy they're pursuing. Because they have very ambitious climate action plans, and they're science-based climate action plans, but a 100% integrated aspect of those climate action plans is that the climate action is also equitable mm. and just, uh, and that cr it creates cities that are much better places to live in. And I think one good example is the city of Seoul. Uh, following COVID-19 and lockdown, they've been asking themselves, like any other city administration, how do we bring back jobs? But how do we do it in a way so it also helps us deliver our climate goals? And they're really looking at the buildings and that's for a good reason, because in, in many global north cities, buildings is really what um, constitutes between 60 and 70 percent of their in-city emissions. Mm. So buildings is essential. And what they're saying in Seoul is, we have old municipal buildings. They are not performing very well in terms of energy efficiency. Why don't we take the first step as the municipal government and make sure that the buildings we own are retrofitted, so they're much more energy efficient, making sure that the workers that are going to, to do those retrofits, that they are upskilled, so that afterwards, when you see demand taking up in the private market, they can go out and deliver the services needed for green retrofits. And, and that program in itself will deliver 20,000 green jobs within just three years in Seoul. So a very efficient program. It's, it's in many ways the most efficient way to bring down emissions. It's upskilling a labor force. Uh, and it's creating better and greener jobs. And maybe to give one more example, and my last example, um, we're also now seeing that many cities are looking at the way they are designed, the way they are, they are planning, um, and seeing how can they plan in a way so, so that they create uh, neighborhoods that are complete neighborhoods, where all the essential things you need to, to live a good life in the city is not more than 15 minutes away by foot or bicycle. Uh, and that, of course, has a very important aspect in the climate crisis because it creates neighborhoods that are resilient. You're not so relying on transport to get what you need, and we've seen in COVID how important that is. But it also creates neighborhoods where uh, the people who are working in the corner shops or who are providing services for the elderly, basically every segment of society can find a place for them to, to, to live. And again, I think uh, a city like Paris is a great inspiration because for them, the 15-minute city strategy is not only about making sure there is access to green spaces or making sure there is access to education or the things you need. It's also really making sure there's access to affordable housing. So they don't have part of the city that are uh, effectively uh, not accessible for those who have normal incomes or, or, or low incomes. So I think those are two great examples of how cities are actually making a lot of progress this year in, in developing a, a, a green and just transition. So interesting. Lots and lots to jump off from there. And I think efficiency and resilience are going to be two ideas that we, we come back to and they came up this morning. But before that, let's hear from Ryan Jude. Thanks. So on the finance side, I just want to take a step back first and talk about a few of the terminology points that people use when they talk about financing for just transition. I think it's very important to address this because how we talk about it informs what the public think. So firstly, we often hear, and I'm glad that Polly quoted the net zero review because it saves me having to do it here, but we often hear the spending being talked about as a challenge or a cost, and we're very keen to reframe that as an opportunity. It's an opportunity for finance to innovate, to invest in opportunities that are fit for our future economy, which is where the taxonomy comes into it. There's also an opportunity to improve our health conditions, build these green jobs, cut inequality, redistribute the costs, and hopefully avert climate disaster. The second thing I want to say is that finance is innovating, so through things such as green finance and social finance. But again, on the terminology, if we achieve what we want to achieve, they're going to just become finance. Green jobs are just going to become jobs. The green economy will just be the economy, because we need to do that to get to where we want to get to in the next few decades. Um, the third one terminology is on just transition itself. I think a lot of time people get hung up on slogans, 
and you hear complaints about people where they say that just transition isn't in corporate plans, isn't in government plans. With the current UK government, for example, when they have their twin goals of net zero and levelling up, that's essentially just transition in another frame. We now just need the public spending to go alongside it, which we've touched on, I'll, I'll touch on a bit more later. So what is finance doing? So quickly on this, there's been a huge growth in recent years in the labelled bond market. So these are green bonds, social bonds, sustainability-linked loans. Green bonds surpassed a trillion dollars in issuance last year. Social bonds, which are fairly new, hit $250 billion in issuance last year, which was a 10 times increase in the previous year. Um, what are these things, though? So um, there's two types of label bonds. It's either use of proceeds, where a green bond will raise finance and then put the money towards a green use of proceeds in, in accordance with a set of principles that the market's agreed upon. There's also the sustainability-linked ones, which are key performance indicator-linked. What that means is that a company, when they issue the debt, the financing of the debt will be linked to certain targets they've agreed in advance. So on the social side, this might be number of jobs that that investment will create. And if they don't hit it in a certain amount of time, they feel that cost on their capital, on their balance sheet, which is, which is important. Um, there's been a big win with these sorts of things in, in recent years with the UK government's green guilt that came out this year. So this was the biggest green guilt at its time of issuance. But what didn't receive as much media attention is that they promised to also report on the social co-benefits. So that is the likes of jobs created and potentially levelling up. They haven't yet specified what the, what the KPIs will be. Um, this is something that we heavily worked towards with the LSE Grantham Institute, the Impact Investing Institute. So we were very happy to see this coming in. But once you start reporting on that is when just transition becomes embedded with the finance. We're also seeing more private finance companies incorporating just transition into their plans. Um, amongst all the policies that came out yesterday, the Greening Finance Roadmap on Monday may have been lost, but not for us at the Green Finance Institute. And in that, for the first time, they're going to be asking companies to specify their transition plans and to report against it, which again is a huge step. And through that, hopefully, we'll start seeing companies committing to job creation and other social KPIs. A crucial point here, then, is that people often talk about this as public finance versus private finance. The debate is... You know, obviously more nuanced than just that binary. We need both, but we need them targeted at the right areas and supporting the right people. So private finance will end up picking up the majority of the funding that we need going forward, but public finance needs to protect the most vulnerable. We can talk about the policies um, throughout the debate, but things such as carbon pricing and ring fencing the revenues to support those on the lowest income is crucial, and also funding for training, potentially transition wage subsidies, but we can talk about all that in the debate. But also, where public financing is spent needs to be its most impactful. So this is through guarantees and grants where it's needed. Guarantees which will leverage the private finance and ensure that you're getting more bang for your buck when you're spending from the public purse. And we have the capacity to do this. The CCC has said that we should be spending 1% of GDP every year. But a recent study has shown that the UK Treasury's current plans are about 0.01%, which is massively under, undercut. I don't know what the update is after yesterday's, but I don't think it's going to change too much. And the cost of inaction is even greater, with predictions showing that we'll hit 20% of GDP if we don't spend today. So, again, Polly quoted what the Net Zero Review said yesterday, and it talked about passing on intergenerational burdens. The biggest burden we could pass on is not spending and not acting now. Um, my very final point, so there's three pillars in the Just Transition financing discussion. There's corporates, governments, and local government. Touched on the first two, on local government, we also need them to innovate on their finance. We're seeing this through things such as local climate bonds, which is something that we're doing with support of Poly and UK100, where councils issue crowdfunded debt from people who live in their local area. What this means is that the people who are more affluent can put their savings into the bond, and then the council spends it in the area, and then it becomes a public good, and it benefits everyone that lives in the area. So that's a great way to redistribute who is shouldering the burden. Um, so I'll leave it there. Many points there. Terminology bugbears. Private finance <laughs> is innovating. Public finance needs to increase with targeted spending, and local councils need to do some work as well. Loads to talk about. I should add, actually, the Treasury also did acknowledge yesterday, didn't they, that uh, the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action, which I think many people thought was, uh, was an interesting move forward for, for the Treasury. Caroline, over to you. Um, thanks very much. Um, as you said, I've been co-chairing a project for Onward this last year on called Getting to Zero, and our project particularly wanted to look at um, the scope for change, but also looking in more detail at those communities who could be more adversely affected by uh, the journey we're on 
if there isn't mitigation, but also the realisation of opportunities as well to replace jobs that inevitably are bound to go. And uh, we've done four reports. Uh, the first report, Getting to Zero, was looking at those most affected. We then looked at Greening the Giants, or as I like to call it, the Dirty Dozen, uh, those 12 industries that are most, if you like, uh, got to move. Uh, to get to where we need to be. Uh, and then we are, our third report was on qualifying for the race to net zero, and that was particularly looking at the skills gap, not only in terms of those younger people coming out of school into the workforce, but also I think in our country, I think historically we've been pretty poor at retraining people while they're in work in order to make the transition either within their sector or into other jobs as well. And our most recent report was called Green Shoots, which was looking at how do you drive innovation uh, to get to net zero. So in the next few minutes, I'll maybe just touch upon a few of the outcomes from that, and I'm sure in the debate we'll get to some answers, hopefully. First of all, I just wanted to say this as a sort of just, I like sort of things that paint a picture. And one of the things the government like to do, and lots of people like to do, uh, is talk about how uh, we have reduced our emissions from 1990 today by about 44%. That's great. Um, but the truth is, in that journey, it wasn't all about a strategic attempt to reduce our greenhouse gases. It was because we shut down manufacturing. We shut down industry. And so for a lot of those places, um, outside of our big cities, in those in towns and industrial communities like the one I used to represent in Doncaster, where I still live, um, they saw uh, their industries decline, but also, I'm afraid, manufacturers seeing a cheaper source of labour elsewhere overseas, so they would get their products made there, and then we'd re-import them back into this country at a far higher carbon potential uh, um, encumbency on them. And as a result of that, we have lost time, I think, in manufacturing to realise the sort of ways those industries have to change in agriculture as well, where actually we haven't looked at the sort of tech and investment that could have made, helped them move faster. Um, so yes, it's a good statistic and, and governments will continue to use it, but there is another story behind it which has had a social and economic cost. And if there is one thing that I feel passionate about to come out of this transition, this journey that we are on, is the opportunity to, in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same for other countries as well, to rebalance our economy economically and socially to make it fairer. And there are challenges, but actually there are real opportunities uh, there as well. So we know that the poor regions of our country uh, depend more on carbon intensive jobs. Two in five jobs in UK's poorest regions uh, are, rely on high intensive jobs. And in London and the South East, we have the lowest proportion of jobs in that sector. In the East and West Midlands, in Yorkshire and Humber, in the North West, it's the highest number of jobs affected. And more than half of, uh, of the highly intensive jobs are in, and highly emitting jobs are in those um, regions. And of course, Scotland, let's not forget Scotland in that too. Now, uh, my constituency um, is a red wall seat. Others claim to be red wall, but that's a political discussion I had. But actually in those constituencies in the red wall, that's where the battleground politically is going to be. So it's worthwhile as considering not only if you like the academic policy but the incentivization for politicians to make change as well and that's where the politics uh, kicks in. 43% uh, of workers in so-called red wall seats work in high emitting industries. Over 50% of the lowest decile constituencies by high emitting jobs are in London. 48% of the top decile of constituencies in high emitting jobs are in rural areas and towns and, and actually this is important as well. Um, it's a lot easier for cities. Uh, they've got a much more diverse labour market. They have proportionally fewer high emitting jobs. They have the transport infrastructure already. I've come down to London <laughs> for this and a few other things. And I constantly, you know, it is amazing the transport infrastructure we have. So forgive me if I get a bit weary of Londoners moaning about it. And I was born in London. Um, it is a big issue. Uh, for those communities in the rural areas and smaller towns. When we did our Greening the Giants report, which looked at those 12 industries that make up two thirds of UK carbon emissions, um, you know, there are some right steps happening, but it is slow still. It is slow, and many of them are not on track, let alone to get to 2050, um, um, uh, to, uh, let alone to get to 2025. So tr those 12 industries that range from aviation,
agriculture, waste, transport, construction. They represent 23% of UK output and 21% of current jobs. And disproportionately, those jobs are in these areas that I've already uh, mentioned. And in those areas, in terms of the value they get from those jobs economically, it is places um, like uh, the East Midlands, Scotland and Wales that are more at risk and more exposed. In qualifications, we also know that in the high intensive jobs, actually the average qualification level is far lower than it is in the sort of net zero uh, jobs that are there. And we also know that the gender pay gap is more considerable, I have to say, in high emitting jobs than it is in um, the net zero area too. But again, there's opportunities here if the government can grasp them to change those jobs. But we've got a problem. Um, let me just leave one example here before we, we go on. There's always a lot of talk about heat pumps. <laughs> there was a lot of talk coming out yesterday on heat pumps. I suppose on one level we we'll succeed when people are so bored of hearing heat pumps, uh, the message is actually getting through. But um, here's something for you to leave you on. 600,000 installations we need each year uh, to get to the target where we need to be. We're not even close to that for 2015, let alone for um, 2028. Uh, the national rollout is 27 million homes. Now here's something to think about and for those watching us today. We now have 1,200 plumbers in the UK capable of installing heat pumps. So if the 1.67 million annual sales of gas boilers were replaced by heat pumps, that would mean we'd have to have those plumbers installing four a day, 365 days a year for God knows how long. That is just one example of the training challenge we have here. And along with that is the lack of investment in construction and transport and elsewhere in terms of uh, research and development. And also still, which I think you were talking about, the lack of incentives that are still there that enable considerable foreign investment to come in and allow us to be you know, first stage ma major players in this area. And all of those things are important. Sorting out the benefits that are paid to people on the poorest incomes and getting their homes done but you've got to create the jobs and the wealth in the economy to take those communities forward. Well, that is a perfect jumping off point for the question that I'm dying to ask. And then I, I, there's, I know there's lots of questions waiting to come in. But Polly, if I can bring you in, we've talked a lot about what, we, what could be a just transition. But what's a green job? Do we even know? Caroline's talked about carbon intensive jobs. But what makes a job green? Well, I, I think there is a lot of uh, discussion about that. Actually, um, it depends. What uh, it depends uh, really on um, a, a range of things. I think importantly, we need to be start thinking about transitional skills, so that we are thinking about the people who are in those energy intensive industries, those dirty dozen that that Caroline mentioned, and how the skills they've got, how transferable they are, supporting those people to be able to repurpose those skills and understand what that means for the kind of jobs they will have at the other end. But also identify um, what you might do to be able to tackle some of the other underlying trends that Caroline has pointed out um, that means that, that, that that's going to be more difficult. The fact that it is in, that quite often you're talking about this, these being in, um, in small towns um, and outside of, of cities. So actually, somebody said to me, oh, don't worry if this, this, I'm sure Caroline will find this is annoying as I did. Somebody said, oh, you know, women will be in a really good place uh, in the a net zero world because lots of the jobs that women do as caring jobs, they're, they're low carbon. And I was like, well, listen, mate, you've not been a social worker having, or, or a care worker having to drive um, like the clappers between uh, appointments because you've only got 15 minutes in order to be able to look after somebody, probably using quite a lot of single use plastics in the meantime and not actually having to not having time or anything to think about what kind of car you use or what, or, you know, what kind of food you provide or any of those kind of things. So there are some it's, it's actually transforming those kind of jobs, which are actually fundamental to our economy, a service industry and so forth will be the kind of thing that a lot of people are not yet thinking about because they are concentrating on the fossil fuel uh, end of it. And I think that's right. Um, I think also um, that it's important to remember that you can't replace a miner in Mansfield with a hipster in Hoxton and say that's the same thing. You have to make sure that you have got a program of transformation for Mansfield and its people if you are going to deindustrialize. And that's the tragedy of the last 40 years is that those that, that deindustrialization has not 
has not been accompanied with a proper kind of reskilling and a focus on manufacturing in particular, because we're going to need to have shortened supply chains. You know, if you are, if you, you can still be making stuff, but if you're making stuff that is sold closer to where you are, that's a greener job than something that is actually being um, uh, in, uh, imported from across the world. So there's loads of different things that will make it difficult. Simon, if I can bring you in, I've been rather like a stuck record. I was in Denmark last week. I've said this several times already today. Uh, and I'm going to pin you down a little bit. I met a, I met a plumber who was installing a heat pump, and I met a car mechanic who was had retrained. He paid for his retraining, but he'd got it subsidised, I think, uh, to, be, to be able to work on electric cars. How has that transformation happened there? And are there lessons that can be applied in this country? Well, I think what, what's important to note about uh, Denmark is that there is a, a, a growing and now I would say very big consensus politically uh, around the need for a, an urgent green transition. So, so from left to right <laughs> in the political spectrum, uh, there, there is widespread su support for uh, even quite uh, radical and ambitious uh, climate policies. Um, and of course, that consensus sends a very important signal uh, to the market, both at the labor side and the employer side, that, that, that this, is, this is the direction Denmark is heading into, whether you like it or not. And you can run out of business if you don't invest in new technologies. And if, as a worker, you don't make sure you're upskilled um, so that you can provide those new technologies that are now becoming much more widespread, you, you might find it more difficult to find a good and, and, and a well-paid job. So I think we are seeing this massive consensus. There's another interesting thing, though, because this, this is the same thing for Denmark as in the UK. In many Global North countries, we've been effectively uh, exporting our emissions mm -hmm. over the past decades. And you could even argue that, that this is the same for cities in, in relation to more rural areas. Because it, it used to be that cities, that's where you found industries, but, but since the 80s, uh, maybe even since the 70s, we've seen that, that industry uh, has moved out of cities. And of course, that has an impact on emissions. But I think cities are also showing what needs to happen in, in, in order to, to get a, a fairer and more, you could say, accurate picture of the emissions that you're responsible for in cities. Because lots of cities, again, that are part of the C40 network, they are now looking at their total emissions. They're looking at the emissions from goods and services, capital investments, you could say consumed within the city, but, but, but produced outside the city. And when you do that, that, that gives you a whole new range of, of, of uh, analysis where you get a much more accurate image of what is it really we are responsible for in a city like Copenhagen in terms of emissions. But it also means that new policies and really efficient policies can come out of that. For example, policies that leads to, OK, so the, the industry we do have, how can we work with that industry to, to, to green it, to green the giants, so to speak? So I think making sure that, that, that when we're measuring carbon emissions, we are doing it in a holistic way, where we're also looking at our consumption, not just the production within our, our boundaries, I think that's that's essential. One more question from me before we take questions from uh, everyone who's listening uh, and relating to this to, to both Caroline and Jude. When we think about then the sort of changes, whether it's a just transition, whether it's uh, the kind of steps that cities and towns could make that Simon's describing, how important is local leadership? We heard quite a lot in the previous session about the need for there to be much stronger devolution, much stronger local leadership. Karen, how, how important is that? I think it is important, but I think they have to be accountable as well. I'd like to see regional carbon budgets, and whether that's under local authorities or our mayoral system here in the UK, uh, you know, you, you've got to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. I would do all retrofitting. I would devolve that to a more local level and also electric, electric vehicle infrastructure as well. I think it's better placed at a local level. But there has to be accountability as well. And that's why, you know, you, the national oversight is to bear down on what is actually happening in those areas. Uh, so we make the progress we need to make. A lot of local authorities have got, <laughs> they've got plans. I think if you interrogate some of those plans, um, they not, might not be all that we might want to see. Ryan, I mean, you, if, if you're going to have local bonds in the way you were describing, that's going to take some local leadership, isn't it? Yeah, I think local leadership is absolutely key. But what we see is that they don't necessarily have the powers to do that right now. And again, I've referred to UK 100 a couple of times, but they put out um, their communique talking about net zero local powers and a bill for that. You need to be able to make 
local leadership accountable for, as Caroline has just said. But also, it's hard to compare different regions across the country. Yeah. So if you're looking at it from a national perspective, you need to give them the powers, give them the funding to go alongside it, and build up standardization so you can measure it. Um, just going back to the point that you were making, I just want to say that political leadership is absolutely key with all of this. If you look at what's happening in the USA at the minute, Joe Biden came, came out with this $2 trillion infrastructure plan. It's a fantastic plan, and my favorite part in it was the Just Transition Fund, where they were going to target retraining for coal workers and what we've seen in the last couple of days, we've seen Joe Manchin in West Virginia come out and block this in the Senate. You know, the reasons for blocking it, we, we can look at the bad faith arguments he's making. But what that means that the he tens of thousands... He represents an area with lots of coal workers. But there are tens of thousands of coal workers there that the plan would be retraining. By blocking the retraining, in 10 years' time, where are they going to be? And that's the... We need to look at long-term political leadership on this. Mm. I'm going to take a question um, from Richard Nelson, who's watching on Zoom. He says, food security is essential and importation is costly, creating a trade deficit. Food that's fresh and local can build the health and wealth of communities. But technologies aren't adap adopted, sorry, aren't adopted because of corporate control by food system and vested interests working to maintain a system of consumerism. Food is also a great opportunity for the reduction of the CO2 footprint of this industry. Why aren't you talking about food who wants to take this on simon why aren't we talking about food what did you have for lunch nothing <laughs> so. well well I, I won't talk about my lunch uh, it was fine uh, but uh, but uh, i think food is certainly a topic that 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 we should talk about and the interesting thing is cities are talking about it. Um, in the C40 network, I've mentioned a few times, uh, close to 100 of the largest cities in the world, they have a very uh, efficient food network where close to 50 of those cities are, are, are uh, you know, exchanging best practice with each other. How can they work with their food systems to make sure that they're reducing emissions from, from the consumption of, of, of meals within the city? And a city like Milan is a great example. They actually have a program where they're trying to make sure that the, the meals they're serving in their schools, for instance, that, that lots of that produce is coming from local producers. Mm -hmm. And that way you make sure it's seasonal and it's local. You reduce the, the need for transportation. It also tends to be healthier, uh, and, and they ca it can be integrated in, in programs. So the, the students are also learning about you know, food and, and healthy nutrition and so on. Um, and, and, and we are seeing lots of other cities taking inspiration from programs like that. The meals they are serving themselves, whether it's in the homes for the elderly or to the, to the, the children in school, that's really where they're starting. And by that, they can influence the market, and it can grow from there and really, really gain scale. Polly, is food a difficult one when it comes to politics? You're asking for behaviour change. It wasn't something that was uh, discussed in the Net Zero strategy yesterday. Uh, is it a tough one for, to sell politically? Oh, we're not hearing you, Polly. Sorry, I unmuted myself. No, it depends. Um, I, I agree. It depends what um, I'm being sen I'm sensible. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, it depends what you're, what you're asking people to do. And I think Simon's completely right. The, the key thing is for local leaders, and this goes to the points about accountability and democratic, uh, democratic, uh, democratic accountability and leadership, is that people, um, people who have got that power and authority need to use that power and authority to demonstrate the direction of travel. So use your procurement powers to do exactly like Simon says about the, the food that you provide in the in the in the uh, in the in the uh, services that you are providing to make sure that you can say that we're doing this differently. Then work with your local private sector to be able to see what you can do differently. We have a countryside climate network as a, as a sub network of UK 100 where we convene um, those uh, local leaders outside of the cities who particularly get immediately focused on what this means for the going getting to net zero, what it means for their agriculture industry. And I say, yeah, of course it means something for your agriculture industry, but that's the thing that you've probably got least influence over when actually what food you provide and what food you commission for uh, for your for your various services is a key thing of sending a sending a signal and that will enable you to be able to find other allies and build support because the last thing people want is to be told what to do what you actually want is to make it as easy as possible for them to do the right thing and that is a key part of local leadership which can really make a difference
Caroline, I want to come back, and it, it does tie up with this conversation, something that came up when you were all speaking at the beginning, it came up this morning, um, this idea of resilience versus efficiency. There are lots of people, I think Ian Golden was talking about it this morning, uh, a lot of how we have lived in recent decades has been about efficiency. The pandemic has taught us perhaps we need to be resilient. How does that fit into the idea then of a just transition? Well, I, I think if you've got the opportunity to create goods and food is the question that we're looking at overseas, bring it in when you don't have as many controls maybe on to, I used to be a public health minister, so I always find my life is overlapping all the time with different things I've done. Um, you know, in more recent years, we've challenged salt, sugar, fats and what have you. And again, that is really important this because to be honest, regardless of, dare I say it, net zero, the way we eat is killing us. Um, and our obesity crisis in this country and that, you know, people are not living or if they are living, they're living with long term conditions is substantially about food and other lifestyle choices. But the choice, what do people have in terms of choice? And that is part of the problem. And is it affordable, the healthier options that they need? Now, it seems to me part of it is if we're serious about this, it's not about closing the doors to imports into the UK but it's making better sense of what we produce here. And agriculture and the food industry is one area where if we're asking them to make changes, changes to provide more healthier food, more meat alternatives, then we have to stop in some ways or restrict or expect them to pay more those imports that are coming in that saturate the food market that actually don't make sense to our food producers here to engage in this debate. And, and you could apply that to manufacturing and other areas of our economy. If we want us to do the right thing here, then the people in the manufacturing sector, whatever it may be, food being one of them, need to think that actually what they're doing is appreciated and supported and they won't run at a loss. Ryan, though, thinking about how you fund a just transition, if the choice is, is often between resilience and efficiency, efficiency is often cheaper. That's why we choose it. It's, it's better in some sense. Resilience may be more expensive. How do you convince markets, governments, taxpayers that it's worth paying for resilience? Well, it's necessary. And whenever I talk about private finance, it's always what can governments do? They can give long term policy certainty. If you direct where the, where the um, route of direction is going, then private capital will follow because they will know that they will need to adapt. The point you were just making there about importing and putting a cost on it, this is where economy-wide carbon pricing comes into it. Exactly. You need to make polluters pay. If the manufacturers are polluting, if they're importing it, if you add that onto the costs, then suddenly they'll be priced out of the market by local produce. As more people buy locally, the costs will come down locally and that will become more viable. So there are definitely levers that can be pushed. I've, I've oversimplified it there. <laughs> but this can be done. We just need the leadership. It needs to be long-term signals to the market. It's interesting. You're all nodding. But, I mean, carbon pricing is still quite controversial in the way you're describing it. It, it is quite controversial. Um, I highly recommend reading the Zero Carbon Commission's report about carbon pricing, where it's economy-wide. But the most important part, if you're going to design it, is to protect those on the lower income deciles. So. And the biggest question that often members of the public say um, is why are we having to do all this? Why are we having to make the changes when they're not doing it in another part of the world? Now, I always feel that it's all, and some politicians say that as well, I have to say. My view is if we don't do it, it's going to be the nightmare. We have to do this. Mm. But it's fair to say if our, if our employers in different sectors are making these changes and looking at ways to change, then that should be rewarded. So I see it as a reward for those, but also just trying to incentivize with sticks and carrots to do the right thing. And it is not fair on our producers here if they're meeting all the things in terms of welfare, climate change and everything else in the food industry if they're undercut time and time again by those imports coming in. I'm going to put my PR person hat on for a moment. I'm not a PR person, obviously. But this idea then of a just transition, is it actually a very important idea both to define and to, in a way, sell to the public for them to accept some of the harder parts of climate change that undoubtedly are going to be there, the higher costs, the fact that you may have to, when your boiler packs up, may have to ditch it for a, a more expensive heat pump, say, to come back to heat pumps. Well, there has to be, uh, it can't be a one size fits all. We have to address those people who are least able to be part of this journey. And, you know, whether it's a boiler scrappage scheme, whether it's removing VAT on something like heat pumps to zero rated, obviously we've got to, we've got to have the workers to put them in mm. as well. But the other thing I think with the public, there will be some people who shouldn't pay because of their economic situation, but even those who can afford to pay something, 
I think one of the things that is stopping them is their lack of trust in where we're going. And look, most of us who have a boiler in our homes, we wait until it breaks down to get another one. It's a big investment for a lot of people. And when they, make, when they reach that point where that happens, they have to be assured that the companies who are trying to sell them a heat pump or whatever else it may be, are reliable and they can confidently put their money into that, as well as maybe down the way having some sort of uh, an incentive by government to help with some of the costs, if not all of the costs. Just, just on heat pumps in particular, um, it's not just certainty for the consumers on where it's going, but also the, the companies that are doing the training. I spoke to heat pump, trainer, um, heat pump installers where they've said that they can't pay some of their staff to retrain to install heat pumps, because once they do it, what's the point? Because they don't know where the demand's going to come from. It was great to see the grants yesterday at five grand, but the average person, if a heat pump is still around seven, eight K, does not have that remaining amount of money. So that grant should have been accompanied with 0% interest loans to cover the rest of it for people at the middle income level. Mm. For people in the lower income level, it should be being paid for by government, by local governments, and this is where the carbon pricing ring fence revenues would help them. For those at the other end of the scale, able to pay market, we need to incentivize them with these loans as well. So there's, there's no silver bullet. There's plenty of policies that need to come in together here. We are almost out of time. Holly, I'm going to ask you one last question that's come in. What do you think local leaders can do to engage citizens in the just transition? Well, it's not just about engaging them. It, uh, the first and most important thing if they need to do is to demonstrate their own commitments. That a lot of them will have declared climate emergencies. And like Caroline says, a lot of them have got plans. But then understanding how they're going to deliver them is a, di is a different issue. Ryan mentioned our power shift report, which is a comprehensive analysis of all the powers that local authorities have got that can be used in order to be able to meet net zero and the limitations that there are on those. So that's a really good handbook for anybody who is interested in what local government can do in order to be able to think, oh, OK, there are powers that can be used in this way, things on energy efficiency, things on planning and procurement in particular. Um, are the ones that I, I keep banging on about because they come they're quite often not the ones that people think of because they actually are right at the heart of your political strategy. Um, so understanding that, but the uh, but the other thing is um, what was acknowledged in the um, in the report yesterday is that local in the strategy yesterday is that local government has influence over about thirty percent of emissions within it, uh, within their own uh, within their own borders, as it were. So that means that there's 60%, sorry, 70%, which they're at, which are, is out of their control, except that it's not. That is where the power of convening of a local authority to bring public and private sector together, the universities, the major employers, the businesses, the residents, and the, the civil society together and say, right, we've declared a climate emergency as a, as a council, but we as a community have to solve this problem and it will involve all of us. And that's where you can have some real uh, game changing opportunities for conversations. But they must use all of the powers they've got before they start telling other people what to do. Holly, we must leave it there. Really interesting conversation. We could have gone on for ages, but I think uh, lots of support uh, for more local powers and uh, lots of support for the idea of the, the importance of a just transition. Thank you very much to everyone. Polly Billington, Simon Hanson, Ryan Jude and Caroline Flint. Welcome back, everyone, to our final session at the Centre for Progressive Policies Inclusive Growth Conference. Remember, if you're on Zoom, you can ask questions via the question and answer function. We're also live streaming on uh, uh, Facebook Live and also on the website via YouTube. And you can also find us on Twitter. The hashtag is IGConf2021. Do join us there if you'd like to. Now, for this final session, we're going to peer into the crystal ball a little bit and consider what levelling up could mean in the long run. How do successive governments go about achieving a healthier, green and inclusive future? And as part of that conversation, uh, we have the launch of a joint APPG statement from the Inclusive Growth and Left Behind Neighbourhoods APPGs. I'm not going to say any more because I have the experts beside me. I'll let our speakers give you the detail. Let me introduce them all. Liam Byrne is the MP, Labour MP for Hodge Hill and co-chair of the APPG for Inclusive Growth. And they've actually been working with the uh, CPP on some key ideas. And of course, we'll hear more about that in just a moment. Paul Howell is the Conservative MP for Sedgefield, and he's co-chair of the APPG for Left Behind Neighbourhoods. 
and he in turn has been working with our next speaker, Margaret Bolton. She's the Director of Policy and Communications at Local Trust. She has a background in policy, research, public affairs and communications. And last and definitely not least is Charlotte Aldrit, Director of CPP. Let's begin first of all by turning to you, Liam Byrne. Uh, thanks. Well, delighted to be here. We're very proud to be CPP's parliamentary wing and very proud to be working together with the APPG on um, Left Behind Neighbourhoods. So as we head into budget week, you know, the big question is how do we stop now a pandemic of uh, disease becoming a pandemic of poverty? Uh, last week at the IMF annual meetings, we heard that global output's been hit by about 17 trillion. Uh, but worse could lie ahead because the crisis isn't over and bad decisions now could cost the world economy another five trillion in lost output. And what's true of the world is true of the UK. And so we put our heads together to think, right, what does levelling up need to mean over the next few years and crucially over the next few days as we head into, uh, into budget week? Now, if I go back 10 years to the great financial crisis, when we were putting our fiscal consolidation plan together, we worried about nurturing growth. We worried about avoiding a double dip recession. We worried about not increasing inequality. You know, we think that a number of mistakes were made after us and we've got to learn from that experience. And so that's why there are sort of three or four big ideas in the joint statement that we've launched today. So the first is education. There is no social mobility. There's no equality without education. And some of you will have seen the IFS work that showed this six and a half thousand pound gap between how much is now spent on a state school student and how much is spent on a private school student. To close that gap nationally would cost us 55 billion pounds. Now, it's possible that we see that money on the table next week, but I doubt it. And that's why we say, look, a good first step would be to significantly increase the pupil premium in places that really need it. Second, health. You know, this is a crisis that is not over. You know, the vaccination rates in our poorest wards in Birmingham are a third the level of the richest wards. And we know that there is a pandemic of mental health that has been really building up now. Yesterday, Duchess of Cambridge uh, launched a fantastic action against addiction campaign, which is an important part of it. We now need government to do their bit. And so making sure that we are protecting community health services, often on the front line. And remember, there could be, the estimates are there's going to be 10 and a half million new cases of mental health treatment needed over the next few years. Safeguarding community health services and public health budgets, absolutely critical. Final piece of the puzzle then for us is place. Some places have been hit a hell of a lot harder than others. And, you know, we do now at least have uh, a government that believes in a creative state. We're delighted that our former co-chair, George Freeman, is now helping lead that charge as a government minister. But, you know, creative states aren't centralised states. And in many ways, we have one of the most centralised administrations that we've had for a long time now. Uh, the irony is Frederick Hayek would be turning in his grave at the approach that is being taken to industrial policy at the moment. And that's why we need radical devolution of funding flexibility to local areas. Let's start by putting the Prosperity Fund, the National Skills Retraining Fund. There's a bunch of other funds in the apprenticeship budget, the adult education budget. Let's start putting them into one pot, devolving them and giving local areas the chance to actually flex the spending to, to their needs. So we've got 10 and a half thousand days now between uh, the pandemic and the deadline to the Paris Agreement. Um, it is probably uh, the most complex set of policy challenges as we try and hold down temperature and wind back uh, inequality. And that's why conferences like this and the work of local trust and CPP are so absolutely critical. Thanks very much. That's a great basis for the conversation we're going to have. Paul Howell, I'm going to let you build on that a bit. Um, thanks. I mean, I'd like to take it from the actual work that the APPG are doing. Um, you know, we, you know, I'm going to make some, you know, opening remarks really that are about what levelling up should do for these neighbourhoods and how this joint statement contribute or should contribute to driving real lasting change. You know, really, I'm, I'm committed to cross-party working to try and address these challenges. Our APPG was set up in July last year with local trust, and again, I would commend them for the work that they've done throughout this process and you know it's important that we work with colleagues from across the country from across the parties and across the two houses it's um, it, it's important that we get a, a complete picture on this um, but also and it's what we've done in our APG I'm sure it's the same in, in, in yours that we need to include the community organizations that are doing so much 
in their you know, a, a amazing work, day in, day out, to improve people's lives. And you know, we've got to develop and support those practical policy solutions that help to improve the outcomes for citizens who face considerable difficulties and disadvantages just because of where they live. Um, and we know the foundational research that the local trust have done for us is the 225 deprived wards with high levels of community need and that people are experiencing a disadvantage just because they live there. Um, there are often areas on the periphery. There are often, you know, in, in my particular patch, there are ex-mining villages, but they're also around the outsides of major towns. There's coastal estates. You know, there's, there's, there's a variety of different ones. I've got three in my patch, but there's, they're, they're throughout the country. It's not, it's not a, a north-south game. It's, 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 it's bigger than that. Um, and what we found is that the challenges are, are, are so different. You know, we, we know that these areas have such low levels of social infrastructure which is essential. If, you know, if you need to build social capital, you've got to have some social infrastructure. Um, we know that they're lacking in resilience. You know, when COVID struck, not only were these communities more exposed to the pandemics due to higher levels of clinical vulnerability, they had lower concentrations of mutual aid groups. Yeah. They were considerably less successful in getting money from charitable organizations. They didn't have people there who had the capacity to do things. Um, you know, so for me and our APPG, levelling up has to help address the range of challenges faced by residents in these neighbourhoods, whether that's economic, social, environmental, health and well-being. It has to help improve outcomes for the people that live there, from educational attainment, driving up skills and improving health, the health and well-being. And to do this, we need a strategic, long-term, targeted approach to improving local outcomes across these policy areas. And the approach to levelling up has to fully involve local people. It has to be led by the local communities. One of the phrases we've used regularly, Margaret, you know, is it, it has to be done with the people, not to the people. Mm. Um, that, that's just you know, fundamental for this to achieve anything. Um, so we've got to start by investing in people that live in the community to build that community's capacity and confidence so that the community itself can be the key player in this levelling up process. Levelling up can't simply be a top-down government project. If it isn't about levelling up from the bottom up, it won't work. Yeah. Um, levelling up also can't simply be about investing in big-ticket physical infrastructure, important though that is. Because if it, does, if it is, it just won't touch the people that need it most. And that's why it's investment in the grassroots over the long term that will contribute to driving real and sustainable change. And that's what we mean by levelling up the left behind. Um, it's about investing in people, their capacity, their skills, and building confidence at the end of the day. They need to have hope. I mean, I talked before, um, in, in my patch, I want a new railway station in Furry Hill. Why? Because that will bring hope to the people that live around there, that people care, and that, you know, it's not just the physical engagement of the transport infrastructure, it's actually the ability to think, actually, the powers that be think about them, whether that's the local authority or whether it's the, the, you know, the government. If you're trying to get that belief and hope. Um, I think, you know, I've, you know you've, I've used the phrase before about we want people to have a perspective that the glass is half full rather than half empty. I think there's another phrase I heard last week, I think it, was, or it might even have been one of the debates um, with um, Sir David earlier, that um, you've got to be able to have a glass that's refillable. You've got to be able to put that hope back in when things, things change. So um, I really welcome the recommendations of the joint statement. Um, our, the key policy objective of a community wealth fund to invest in the essential building blocks of social infrastructure in these communities that don't have many of the things that most of us take for granted. It's just fundamental to me. Um, and um, if we're to ensure that the most left behind neighbourhoods are best prepared to overcome the challenges of a climate changing world and avoid a repeat of the damage caused by previous economic restructuring, we must give them greater power and control over what happens locally. That's why I'm really supportive of the statement and I'll be championing these and other recommendations as we go forward. I think the, um, the, the final point to make in terms of the, the climate agenda, one of the things we found in our last report, just to, just to conclude, yeah. was that sometimes getting the message of people doing the right thing, mm -hmm. i.e. insulating their house because it will take their bill down, actually also has the knock-on effect that it helps the climate. Yeah. And it's about how we get the messaging in to make people take actions that affect their lives and move, make it move forward. Lots of interesting thoughts there. And a refillable cup would, of course, be a green cup. So that would be a good thing. Um, Margaret, over yeah, to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
Great. So, um, elaborating on some of the things that Paul said, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've learnt at Local Trust from nearly 10 years' experience supporting deprived communities to improve their neighbourhoods and how that relates to the approach that government's currently taking to levelling up. Um, one thing that's crystal clear to us, and Paul's already mentioned this, is the importance of investing in social as well as hard um, economic uh, infrastructure. Um, and by social infrastructure, uh, I think we mean um, particularly spaces and places to meet. Um, we mean community organisations and um, activities. Um, and for us, those are important um, because they help to ensure that residents have a strong network of support. Uh, they bolster health and they smooth access to work and training. Um, research that we've commissioned, which, is, which as Paul has already said, was the foundational research for the APPG for Left Behind Neighbourhoods, um, shows that residents in council wards that are not only severely deprived, um, but also lack this infrastructure, have markedly worse socio-economic outcomes. Um, and that's across all metrics. So it's employment, it's health, it's education. Um, and even before the pandemic, um, the gap was actually widening between those communities um, and others. Um, so we need to invest in social infrastructure, um, but our view is that we also need to do it in the right way. Um, so we actually have a recipe for levelling up, oh. and it has five ingredients. Mm. Um, it's not currently part of the government's cookbook, <laughs> um, but we'd like to get it written in. Um, so first, um, we, th we think it's crucially important that we invest at the neighbourhood level, and that's starting with the communities who are the most deprived or left behind. Um, second, this funding should not be um, awarded through a competitive process. It should go direct to those communities. And that's actually because they're, they're the communities that lack the knowledge and skills to be able to fundraise successfully. And so, you know, if we, if we don't move away from competitive processes, um, you know, they're never going to access funds and they're never going to be able to catch up and they'll fall further and further behind. Um, third, again, as Paul has said, um, we should trust the residents of these neighbourhoods to know how the cash could best be spent. And I think that's for a number of reasons. Um, I think it's because if projects are developed by local people, um, they tend to have a lot more traction, they achieve um, better outcomes, and that approach actually builds capacity in communities, and it also seeds the development of local institutions which can leave a lasting and sustainable legacy. Um, fourth, investment needs to be long term. Um, and by that, I think, you know, we're talking about 10 to 15 years. And um, that's basically because that's what you need to actually build capacity in communities um, and also to see those institutions um, that I was talking about. Um, I think, though, that an important thing to say is the investment can be very small scale um, relative to what we're investing in economic infrastructure. And then, um, finally, fifth, communities need to be mentored um, or otherwise supported to ensure that the cash is well spent, but also to ensure that communities um, don't burn out. Mm. Um, this may seem pie in the sky, to continue the cooking metaphor, um, but Big Local, which is the programme that Local Trust 
administers is based on those five principles. And we would argue that it demonstrates how such an approach can be transformational. So the programme awarded one million to each of 150 communities in 2012, and Local Trust has been supporting those communities um, to spend that money since. Um, and I guess to, to illustrate this point about how the investment can be transformational, I want, wanted very quickly to give you just one example of a big local area. Um, so Lawrence Western Big Local serves a housing estate on the edge of North Bristol, um, which suffers from severe unemployment, um, also child poverty. And the community have used their big local money on a wide range of projects to improve the estate. And they've used it to leverage in um, millions in external funding. So for example, they conducted some market research that persuaded a low cost supermarket to locate to the area. That brought local jobs. It also provided access to cheaper food um, for the residents of the estate. Um, they're also working with the public sector to develop a 1.8 million health and community hub. Um, they've also developed passive housing and a solar farm, and they have planning permission for the country's largest wind turbine. Um, so that's really just to scratch the surface of what they've achieved, but it gives you a flavour of what's possible. Um, and just to finish, I think that's why um, our proposal for a community wealth fund is crucially important, because that would enable the same sort of investment in communities going forward. Um, and we really welcome the fact that um, the Community Wealth Fund is recommended in the joint statement um, by the APPG for Left Behind Neighbourhoods and the APPG for Inclusive Growth. So, you know, we'd like to thank you very much for that. Thank you. That's great. This theme of local has been a very big one today. Charlotte, I'm going to let you comment on what's been said and perhaps tie up some of these threads too. Thank you. So I'm not going to add too much, but I'm just going to reflect on some of the themes you say, Ritala, that we've heard um, this afternoon. And um, I commented earlier that I've been really struck by the degree of consensus there is around this push to do things locally. And there's a huge amount of consensus around the need for uh, an appropriate net zero strategy. We're, we're waiting for this, uh, you know, like manna from heaven, what is levelling up and, ha you know, the white paper and the, the SR that's going to fit, fall behind that and really help us to deliver the kind of change that we're talking about, tackling inequality, tackling entrenched deprivation, um, supporting, um, you know, so-called left behind communities and, and seeing a step change in the kinds of things we want to see around a healthier, greener and fairer economy. There's a huge amount of consensus in the policy community and, and in the media in the wider commentariat. But this needs to translate into action on the ground. It needs to be driven by a shared mission at, at that national level, but a recognition of the, the role of, of local in delivering that. At CPP, as I said earlier, we run um, our inclusive growth network of 12 places across the UK that are pioneering ways to, to um, push ahead on clean, inclusive growth. And um, together, you know, with cross-party um, cross-party leadership, cross-party uh, engagement, cross-party working of the kind that we're exhibiting today with the launch of our statement, as well as getting those resources and, and policy levers all working in the same direction. I feel um, quite optimistic, we were talking about at the beginning, um, as to, as to the, the fact that we can affect change. And we can affect change because we are seeing it on the ground already. The kind of examples that you um, talked about through, through local trust. But the other thing that I just wanted to to highlight is that I think um, whilst we can get excited about policy documents and um, all the rest, particularly in the kind of Westminster bubble, um, I, I think we need some humility and a recognition of when we need to step back and, ex and, and examine our own systems and processes and identify when they aren't necessarily working for the objectives that we're trying to pursue. And there was a brilliant paper um, that you published, Local Trust, um, that identified where local government, for example, could be as much part of the problem as it can be part of the solution. 
And that applies to any kind of institution, whether we're talking about the NHS, whether we're talking about central government, whether we're talking about any um, of our, of our um, public, private, civic institutions. And I think that sense of what a shared national mission is and the, and the humility to really get under the bonnet of how we address and, and deliver that collectively has to be the next step. So we're really looking forward to um, the various government announcements over next week. COP26 is a huge kind of global event and a, a global milestone that we're going to need to hit. But I think the thing that I take away and the thing that we, we strive to do at CPP is to work with partners to really make it happen. And I think that's going to that's going to require a deep level of system change that I don't think we're quite geared up to um, to yet acknowledge, um, let alone realise. But there are there are seeds of change, and there are, there are there are you know green shoots um, that make me feel positive that we will um, make it happen because we have to. Yeah. Some great thoughts there, and it's good to have some positivity and some great examples as well from Margaret, but I'm afraid I'm going to be the voice of cynicism, as you'd expect. Uh, Paul and Liam, it's been sweetness and light from the two of you, all this cross-party consensus working together, but is it actually going to happen? How far can you push this beyond, you know, obviously the good relationships you have within APBGs, between APBGs? Paul, I mean, you know, are, are, are the higher-ups in your party actually going to listen? I, I hope so. Um... You know, I, I just you know, like we all have, we've just come from, you know, from uh, you know, conference season. Uh, one of the things that happened at the um, Conservative Party conference was um, a, a leaflet that was put out by myself and a number of other colleagues. It was about a, a dozen of us that put it out, uh, which was all about trusting the people. Mm. Uh, and that was about just making sure it goes back to a little bit of what Liam was saying in terms of place. You know, it's about investing in place, and, it, and maybe it's that to. A, a comprehensive investment and a, to use what Margaret was saying, it's a patient investment. It's something that takes place over time. Um, and I absolutely endorsed, you know, the, the, that, that term, that document that was produced there. Um, I know, um, because I was at one of the, um, the sessions there, you know, that um, you know, Michael Gove was on the table you know, that was discussing the presentation of this document. And I'm, you know, I'm sure he didn't, disagree, didn't agree with everything that was in it, but there was a lot of consensus to what was put out there that he seemed to be very supportive of. So I'm very optimistic that, you know, you know, amongst others, he will drive that, um, that, that agenda forward. So, so, Liam, from your point of view, how do you drive that agenda forward? How do you turn this paper into something real? I think you've really got to push with some real case studies to exemplify the problem. So if I take um, the big local area in my constituency, Bromford and Hodge Hill, that I fought for nearly 10 years ago now, um, you know, a couple of messages really stand out. One, it has got to be long term because things go wrong and actually you need time for people to kind of recover. Um, two, you need a, a lot tighter integration with people who have actually gone to the trouble of standing for an election. Um, sometimes that has not always worked well. But, you know, I also fought on this estate to get an £8 million health centre. We could not get that health centre open to community groups because it was built with an NHS lift contract that meant that the rent on the health centre was so high you could never get a community group in there. You know, we have the highest rate of child poverty in the country in my constituency, in part because wage rates are so low, you need two parents in work in East Birmingham if you are to earn above the poverty line. There is no childcare, and nor are there resources to put childcare in place on the Bromford estate. When we were redeveloping the homes, how hard do you think it was to get Western Power to move the transformer so that we could bring two blocks down, put in 300 new houses that we want to pioneer retrofitting? Absolutely impossible because we've got no local power to do it. So, you know, very often it is these kind of intractable barriers because local areas don't have the power and the resources to put it in place. You know, we know that the thing that could make the most jobs fastest would be two business improvement districts. You know, they've got a great record for increasing employment. How, how many officers do you think we can hire to push through a business improvement district in East Birmingham? We, we, we have no power or resources to, to put, so, so, so I'm having to do half, you know, half, half the work. So you, you, you've just got these kind of chasms between the kind of the, the, the theory and the practice. And unless you can find a way of getting the power and the money at that local level, as was described, you ain't going to move it forward. I am going to come to questions uh, from uh, people listening and watching uh, in a moment. But Margaret, just building on that then, how frustrated are you by 
the political cycle, if you like. I mean, we're already starting to talk about the next election. Uh, for you, who clearly you believe in long-term projects, the need for these, I think you said 10 to 15 years. Um, uh, um, how do you feel about that? How does it work alongside the work that you're doing? It's our democratic process. Well, it is frustrating, you know, given that we're all agreed that there's a need for 10, 15 years um, of investment, you know, a commitment to that length of time when that just doesn't work with political cycles. Um, and, you know, I think there's quite a lot of evidence with the existing levelling up funds that they're really about shovel-ready projects. Um, and um, not to want to sound too cynical myself, but they're geared at trying to make a difference um, before the next election. Whereas if we want to build back better, if we genuinely want to level up, you know, we do really need to take that very long-term view. Um, but to be frank, that's why with our Community Wealth Fund proposal, we're suggesting that that could be funded from dormant assets. Cause that's, Such as? Um, well, uh, things like bonds, stock, shares, insurance policies, and there's actually legislation in Parliament at the moment to release a wider range of dormant assets for good causes, and that's the money that we think um, could be made available to set up a community wealth fund, and that it should be an independent endowment, and that takes it you know, out of um, you know, the political cycle in terms of funding. Uh, one other brief question, a detail from what you were talking about, about uh, uh, devolving or giving out uh, uh, levelling up funds. You talked about the need that there should be no competitive process. But then who decides who gets the funds? How do you decide? You decide um, based on need. So you decide um, based on data. So you look at which are the areas that are most severely deprived. Um, you might also look, we would argue, you should look at which are the areas that are most lacking in social infrastructure, um, you know, given those are the ones that, um, are, uh, that have the worst outcomes, mm. um, you know, markedly worse outcomes. I'm going to go to a question from uh, Tony Smith, who's watching via Zoom. He says, 20 years ago, we started some approaches to levelling up local places which took on board many of the points made by the speakers. New Deal for communities, neighbourhood renewal and neighbourhood management. Do the panel think the government could learn from those initiatives? Liam. Ab ab absolutely. I mean, we, we went through this cycle you know, at the end of the 90s and the neighbourhood renewal strategy in particular, creating floor targets for each ward um, was supremely important. But, you know, I'm surprised actually Tony has missed this out from his question because actually the, the final piece of the puzzle was an initiative called Total Place, which uh, allowed you to basically pool all of the public sector send it, uh, all of the public sector spending in a particular geography and say, right, let's put all of that in one pot. And that would get round your problem with, you know, you can't open the health centre because it's too expensive. You can actually hire the people to move um, the power transformer. Um, and it's going to be more and more important now with things like retrofitting. So, you know, in the West Midlands, we need to retrofit 156 homes a day between now and 2035 to hit our net zero targets. Now, you can't do that by just handing out green grants to individual homes. You've got to take, you know, a block by block, street by street approach. But because of the cost, you're going to have to find ways of leveraging lots of different bits of mm. public money. So. We can absolutely learn about that. I think you can learn a lot from big local, um, but total, you know, at the end of the day, money is the root of all progress. And so, so Paul, are we just reinventing the wheel then in this conversation? Um, it's difficult for me to say. I mean, I, uh, it's, um, I'm not an experienced politician. I've been in, in, in this job since uh, 2019. I've been a councillor since 2016. It's a very political I, answer, I if I may uh, say. <laughs> I, I, <wasn't, laughs> I, I don't have the depth of knowledge that Liam has on those particular things. But clearly, you know, we all know that initiatives come round and come round, but they've got to make a difference. They've got to actually get through the stage of, of doing things. And I know, you know that sometimes things happen with you know, what might seem good intent and actually don't come out with the results that you want them to. Um, you know, we know about you know in, in, in times when you know local authorities have transferred community centres to local people, mm. but I've heard that described not as an asset transfer but as a liability transfer. Yeah. 
you know, and, and, and what's happening is the people who are doing the work as volunteers are spending too much time trying to finance the building instead of doing the volunteering work that they want to do. Yeah. So we've got to find a way through that, and that's you know that's why this, to me, this is why this sort of funding initiative is something that I'm very happy and delighted to get behind in terms of trying to do something about. I can't comment on the, the history. So, so, so just then something that you probably do have a view on in terms of then how we make the most of this moment, which is also something we've talked about quite a bit today. How can you ensure that this commitment to building back better actually outlasts the pandemic? That in a year and a half's time when we're worrying about, I don't know, rising gas and oil prices and rising inflation, this isn't all forgotten. Uh, uh, that's about the integrity of, of, of us in the house and making sure that we do push things through as to, as to where they are and that we don't you know, jump from one agenda to the next, that we actually stick to it. I mean, one of the things that um, almost frustrated me, and you know, it was because of timing and where you were, but the very first report we did as, as in, in um, the, the um, Left Behind Neighbourhoods thing was about the impact of COVID because COVID got here before we could do anything else. Yes. And it was really important to me that we didn't turn it into a COVID agenda because the whole um, ethos of doing left behind neighborhoods was there before COVID came. And it's a longer term thing than that. It's a longer term initiative than that. It's about, you know, understand yes, it's had an impact. Of course it has. It's had an impact and a disproportionate impact on the, particularly the communities that we've looked at here. But you know, the, 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 the gaps in society were already there and we need to do something about them. And I think the politics of it, I mean, you know, Boris Johnson has got a job to do for Paul, which is to, you know, help it help Paul get re-elected. And, you know, and therefore, um, at the end of the day, the number of, the amount of the electorate that is now tribally one party or another is at the lowest level ever. So, you know, we're living in a time now where the, where the, where the electorate is more volatile than ever before um, and therefore up for grabs in that sense. And frankly, if you can't deliver on your promises, then actually, you know, we're not going to last long in last long in office. So I think actually the, 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 the politics of this do point in a particular direction. And Shut I, but sorry, sorry, just, just to yeah. build on that point slightly, you know, the, it, it, that's one of the frustrations though, isn't it? That mm. um, it be, it's too easy to become you know, a two, three, four, five year agenda as opposed to mm. what we've seen in some of our yeah. sessions where this, some of these things actually need to be 15, 20 year session yeah. mm. agendas and we need to uh, embed them in the longer term. Sorry. No, Charlotte, I was going to bring you in because I imagine mm. this is something that concerns you as a policy thinker, policy maker. Well, I mean, just to say, the, sort of state the obvious, really. I mean, political cycles can disrupt, but you know, we still want to hold on to our democratic, democratic institutions and practices and all the rest. And I think that's healthy. Um, but I think, as Paul was saying, it's about the integrity of Parliament to maintain focus on the things that really matter. And I think if it's not clean, inclusive growth and um, building a more resilient, healthier population, then what is our industry and public policy and politics all about? Mm. Call it levelling up, call it whatever you like. Um, that's what it has to come back to. And I think, um, you know, Jim O'Neill this morning talked about um, kind of political squabbles even within parties. So Theresa May refusing to mention the Northern Powerhouse Partnership because it happened to be a kind of Osborne invention. Um, so I think it's not just cross-party, it's within party as well. And... Um, and if I could finally just come back to Tony's question, I think the other thing, and I'm mindful of at CPP, particularly the emphasis that we put on investment in social infrastructure, you know, health, um, education, the role of place, as, as Liam was talking about, that form the, the kind of mainstay of this joint statement. I think we have to look back at um, uh, programs such as New Deal for Communities, Neighbourhood Renewal and, 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 and others, by the way, I think total place is the key to freedom, so I would be pushing that. But I think we need to ask ourselves why they didn't necessarily shift the dial to the extent that we are demanding now. What can we learn that went wrong or didn't work as well as we would like? As do, much do as you have one any of the thoughts about Well, I think the key, th but the key thing is the emphasis you put on social infrastructure. So, you know, I remember in the latter stages of New Deal of New Deal communities, because most of the money was capital, it was easier to get investment in new bollards than it was in retraining. Mm. And actually, the way I brought unemployment down in Kitts Green was not through bollards. It, I needed retraining budgets. And so the emphasis that you put in the statement, I think, on education, on social infrastructure, on childcare, that is the key lesson to learn from the past. Now, 
that does have implications because it does mean that we need to start thinking about well what are the rights that people should have to good childcare, to a good education, to good police services, to catch up services at school. We, we concluded at the end of the Labour government that we needed to take the 167 performance indicators that we had for running Whitehall and boil it down into 10 core rights. And actually that's where I think this statement could go next in terms of just teasing out, right, what are the rights of a citizen of Birmingham on the Bromford estate to childcare, schooling, public safety, you know, etc. That's where I think we could take it. And an evolution of that, as, as we've alluded to all this afternoon, is around kind of Treasury and Whitehall departments kind of reflecting back, as I said before, where they themselves are a barrier to effecting change. And it's that kind of getting locked in orthodoxies that don't allow you to think about new approaches to um, um, accounting for uh, resource spend versus capital. These are the kind of things that get in the way of progress. I know everybody wants to come in. I want to bring in Margaret for a moment. Margaret, comment on that by all means. I'm just going to give you an extra little bit to chew on. Spending review next week. We've hacked into the Treasury's computers. I mean, how would you <laughs> prioritise? Well, could I come back? Of course, yes, yes, go on. That's OK. Um, so we've commissioned quite a lot of research, you know, looking at past regen initiatives and um, and basically the message from that research is that where previous regeneration schemes have given communities um, power and control over resources they've tended to be more successful um, in areas where there's been investment in foundational social infrastructure you know, initiatives have had a more significant and a more sustained impact. Um, so I, so you know, echoing um, many of the things that other people on the panel have said, you know, those two things um, seem to be, you know, crucially important um, in terms of levelling up and how government develops its agenda. And sorry, we're glad I've forgotten. No, that I was just saying, question. in terms of the conversation we've just been having about. Um, actually keeping these changes going and where the priorities lie. I mean, if you, if you could get your hands on that spending review, where would you put the money? I would put the money into um, a local area or some of the money into a local area initiative because we've had investment that's about towns, we've had investment that's about high streets, you know, we've had investment that's broadly about hard physical infrastructure, um, but we haven't as yet had revenue investment, you know, in communities. Mm. Paul, sorry, you wanted to come in earlier. Yeah, no, I was just picking up on what Charles said, really, in terms of, you know, um, treasury and, and, and accounting and all of this. I mean, I, you know, my, my history before this place was, and I was I'm, an, I'm an accountant by trade. Um, so I get the difference between capital and revenue. But one of the discussions we had at um, one of the seminars was the fact that um, you know, getting capital spend is sometimes easier than getting revenue spend. Well, if you invest in training, is that capital? Or should it be capital when in actual fact it goes as revenue? Yeah. You know, it's, it's an investment in exactly. a short-term fixed period of time. And I think there is you know, the opportunity to try and look at that space um, a little differently to, uh, to where we have in, in the past. It's often easier to raise money for buildings than it is for yeah. people because you can yeah. see the building. But being realistic, Liam, it's likely that there will be fiscal tightening in a few weeks' time or we're going to learn about it. There's not, you know, the Chancellor's made it quite clear that money is not going to be sprayed about in perhaps the way yeah. it has been during the pandemic. What do you think will happen to the budgets that you're discussing, won't they? Won't, won't the situation get tighter before it gets better? Yeah, I fear the worst. <laughs> it's about, I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, the the, the path that uh, Rishi has set himself is, um, is is pretty aggressive. And and funnily enough, I mean, it's not something the IMF are recommending. Um, you know, the IMF are very clear that now is not the time to be raising taxes. They're very clear that there needs to be a social recovery. Um, they really understand at an international level what the damage is um, mm. to education and in um, in health systems. I mean, you think I, I have head teachers in in Hodge Hill tell me that the kids coming back into school into reception now, you know, they will often forgotten the norms of eating at a table with a knife and fork. Uh, there will be kids that have you know lost the art of toilet training, you know. And when you really push head teachers on how far behind. Mm. 
or how much time they think children have lost, many are saying two to three years. That's the multiplier effect of the education that they've lost. So, you know, it's why we put such an emphasis on pupil premium. We're not going to find £55 billion pounds to equalise public and private education. Um, but we could make sure that children who have had their education knocked sideways do get some catch up. Paul, how do you persuade the government to take a, a perhaps a longer term view? Well, I, I think that it's one of the challenges and has been ad infinitum for every government every time. Um, but I think that um, you know, we've got um, a completely different profile in the Conservative backbenches these days to what we've had mm. for, forever, probably. Mm. Um, and I think the opportunity there is for colleagues, my colleagues on the backbenches um, to make sure that we do push for, for the, the things that we see as being a longer term investment for our for our communities and I would endorse what Liam just said, I've been around schools and had exactly that conversation, you know, sometimes it's, um, you know, the, you, you go in as a non-educationalist, no, oh, sorry, as a non-educationalist and you're, uh, you know, you're expecting the challenged children to be the young people who are just sitting exams and all of this sort of thing, but actually it's the foundational levels yeah. where, it, um, where it seems to be having the, the biggest impact from what the heads are telling me, yeah, I'd agree. I'm going to bring in a question from Richard Nelson, uh, who's watching on Zoom. He says, levelling up, originating from the bottom up, is the right way. Even guidance from the top is suspect, let alone programming. Is this going to be policy? I'm not quite sure I know what that means, but Charlotte, are we saying, I think what Richard's saying is, is levelling up going to be policy? Is it going to be a... Um, is it going to be allowed to be from the bottom up as opposed to from the top down? That's how I'm going to interpret it. Um, well, I think, first of all, it's worth saying that I think levelling up as a policy is uh, to do it a disservice because that would imply that it's, you know, a singular, um, you know, levelling up fund, as we saw in the, in the March budget, for example, or that the white paper that we're looking forward to is somehow going to be, be you know, that cliched silver bullet. Mm. And that's the policy. You know, what we're talking about here is something that goes much bigger than a single kind of policy announcement. It is about a deeper systemic change that has to be underpinned by bottom-up engagement and delivery, to use kind of Whitehall speak. Um, I think the idea of guidance from the top, um, if that is that shared national mission that brings in the role of business, and, you know, 12 months ago we heard a terrific statement from the you know, UK leading um, business leaders around their commitment to build back better from the pandemic. If, if, that's, if that kind of shared mission, public and private sector, is guidance from the top, then actually I welcome it because I think that is going to galvanise the real change that we need. But levelling up needs to be more than a policy. It needs to be something that is systemic across our institutions, across our government departments, and right down to, you know, the kind of local trust grassroots mm. end of the spectrum. You have to ask, what, we're going to move to a point quite soon where we have to answer the question, what are we levelling up? So if you're born in the poorest group at the moment in Britain, it will take your family five generations just to get to average wage. How are you going to level that up? There's an eight year gap in life expectancy between Sutton Coalfield and Aston. Are we going to level that out? The police response in East Birmingham is far slower than it is in other parts of the region. Are we going to level that up? So, you know, what, what are the equalities, basically, that we're seeking to deliver? We invented rights in this country. You know, we wrote the European Convention on Human Rights. We are, you know, going back to Magna Carta. We've got this tradition. The Magna Carta has got a great deal to say about fish weirs, but not a lot to say about digital literacy. So actually just thinking about what are the rights that we want to level up for all citizens of this country has got to be where this goes next. And if there's a national framework for that, great. Delivering on that needs to be a local idea. Paul, I mean, you could argue it was a slogan in search of a policy, and that policy we're told is coming. Does it matter to you whether it's top down, bottom up? Um, to be frank, no. no. Um, to, to me, it's a bit. You know, uh, I hate to agree so violently, but uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know it, 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 it's it, levelling up will mean so much to so many different people. You know, if you haven't got a job and there's job opportunities created, then it'll mean something to you. 
if you've got antisocial behaviour in your neighbourhood and that's been dealt with, then it'll mean something to you. As, a, as two you know, completely different examples to, to the sort of things that'll mean if your life gets better. It goes back to that anal analogy earlier about the wine glass. If the glass has suddenly become half full instead of half empty, then you're in a better place. But it's one of those things that it can be easily described or, or, or pulled apart as a rhetoric if the actual things that are delivered aren't, haven't been on the specific things that you thought it was part of. Mm. So the challenge in my eyes is for, um, you know, and I think it's probably going to form particularly on Michael Gove's desk, um, is to get something that is understandable, comprehensible, and people can see that this is what's being delivered and this is the route that we're going along with a vision to deliver something over a period of time. And, you know, we need to see things happening quickly to see, to, so that people can believe in, you know, it's like the proverbial Titanic, it is. You know, you've got to turn it and move it and get the, damn, get the big ball moving. Once it's moving, then we can try and gather pace. But you've got to start it moving in the first place. We're almost out of time, Margaret. I'll let you give your thoughts. Bottom up, top down. Well, I'm sorry to disagree with you, Paul, but it'd be very boring if we always agreed on everything. But no, it's me and him are supposed to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but I met the panel. Yes. But I guess from my perspective, I think it's really important that it's bottom up. And that comes back to what I was saying about, you know, it's the people in left behind or de really deprived neighbourhoods that know best about what needs to happen in their area. And, you know, I think um, that could be regarded as quite a radical proposition. But, you know, if you think about it logically, what, what makes us think that politicians and bureaucrats in Whitehall know what's best for the people of Lawrence Weston, for example? You know, it's the people who live on that estate in North Bristol um, for whom the stakes are really high, you know, around these political and funding decisions that are made. So I think just we should place more onus on them and their views. No, no, I've just got to come back on exactly that point. That, you know, the thing we said earlier, and we've said it consistently, Margaret, we're both on exactly the same page. It's about doing it with people. So it's the people at the top doing it with the people at the bottom. Whoever starts the discussion, I don't care. But it's got to be a joined up discussion. But I think right. we, we can't underestimate the challenge of building the social capital yeah. in the first yeah. place. And, yeah. you know, I'm afraid the, the nature of our housing market today, I, I have four wards where when I look at the electoral register each year, there is a 20% turnover on mm -hmm. the electoral register. Mm -hmm. So just the, the, the nature of the housing market today and, you know, in many of those streets now we have HMOs or um, exempt accommodation where the, the, the social capital is basically evaporating each year mm. at a faster pace at which we're able to build it. And, and actually, you know, that was one of the big struggles for the big local on the Bromford and Furs estate. It took five to six years before we could really start bringing a coherent group of people together to act as that kind of glue. And that's, you know, that's just because we're swimming against a stream that is moving, moving against us sort of quite quickly. I'm going to stop you there, I'm afraid, because I've already crashed book at bedtime. Uh, it is time for us to wrap up. Thank you so much to the panel, to Liam, to Paul, to Margaret and to Charlotte. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. It has been inspiring and insightful and lots of themes, I think, that have cropped up. We've talked a lot about the importance of the local. We've talked about growth, cooperation, imagination and resilience. All of these ideas have come up. Um, if you want more, CPP is launching a podcast. There's more competition. I shouldn't be plugging this, should I? They're launching a podcast. You can access it via the website. It's there now, uh, the Inclusive Growth Podcast. You can also get it on your regular podcast providers, uh, Acast or uh, I don't know, where else do we find them? Apple, Spotify, wherever you go. It's there. Subscribe. Uh, and remember, today's sessions will also be available on the website. So please do take a look. Also subscribe to the CPP newsletter because uh, you'll find out more about up upcoming events and uh, it will be lovely to have you with the CPP more regularly. But for now, thank you very much to our host, to Charlotte and everybody from the CPP, to all our speakers and to all of you for watching. <laughs>